Sorry, can you explain it again? Well, first, it's mission following a breach of the peace. What, what does that mean? 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 Tommy, we all saw you get in the back of that police car, that police truck. What happened after that? So, everyone saw visibly I was arrested for breach of the peace. What I find surprising is no one's ever mentioned breach of the peace. No one's ever mentioned the fact that's what I was arrested for. I was arrested for breach of the peace and I was driven to Leeds Ellen Road Police Station. So a 10 minute drive from the court. I was, I got to the, the police station. Now, anyone who's been arrested knows the first thing they do is they take you to the, the front desk where you're booked in for your crime. You're asked if you want your solicitor and then you're put in a cell to wait for your interview. This was different straight away. I wasn't booked into the police station. I was held in a side room at the police station for probably 40 minutes. Which straight away I was thinking, what's the, the police station's not going to be busy. It's, a more, it's, it's in the morning. And I was then taken, I, I got brought to the front desk and told I'm being moved to court. I'm being taken straight to court. Again, I asked for breach of the peace. They said no for contempt of court. So then they took me in a police, wag in a police wagon in the back of the court and I was taken to the, the, the courtroom. What actually transpires is that, now, when people have to ask why this happened in this way, because if they'd have arrested me outside the court for contempt of court, and everyone would have known I'd been arrested for contempt of court, because my, my solicitor contacted the police station as soon as I'd been arrested. I said I want a solicitor. Um, they spoke with my solicitor, and the police station told my solicitor, told my solicitor, Alison Gurdon, that I was being released. I wasn't released. I, I, and then when I, when I arrived at the court, I again asked for my legal multiple times. I said, I want to speak with my solicitor. I was told I couldn't speak with my solicitor. Now, if my solicitor had known, if there wasn't a breach of the peace and I'd just been arrested for contempt of court, my solicitor would have known to send, send a representative to the court. But they refused me point blank. I was not allowed the opportunity to speak with my solicitor. So why did they tell your solicitor that you had been released if you had not been released? Did you ever walk free of the police station or the courthouse? No, I was transported. I was transported straight from the police station in the van, straight into court, straight into a cell of court, and then refused the opportunity to speak with my lawyers and um, brought up before the judge. I stood before the judge where he watched, I'd say, seven minutes of the video. Remember, it was over an hour long. Right. He watched seven minutes. I was then put back down in the cell. Still, I was asking for my solicitor, my solicitor. I was then... A prepared lawyer that was at the court was then put before me where I told him, again, I want to speak to my solicitor. So this was a public defender? A public defender um, who I asked, again, can I speak to my solicitor? And I asked him, what is it I've said? What is it I've done? Yeah. I was not told. Um, he just said contempt of court. I said, but what? It's still, still sitting here now. Bearing in mind, I'm, I'm going to face another trial in a few weeks. I've still not been told what I've said. In fact, this trial was supposed to happen today on the 4th of September. The reason it's been put back is because they still haven't told me what it is in that hour-long video that breaches con to contempt to court. Can I take you back to when you first met the judge and he watched five or seven minutes of the video? Did he ask you any questions or say anything, or did you just sit there while he watched it? I sat there while I watched it. I made it clear that um, if there was a problem, I'd delete it. If there's a problem with it, I would delete it instantly if there was a problem. Um, I think that lots of people have read so many things. I, I remember getting to prison and reading, reading in reports that I pled guilty. I was never asked if I was guilty or not guilty. I was never asked. I was never told what crime I committed. Um, so bearing in mind, I know this. I know what's happened in court. I know that... I'd asked, can it not get adjourned so that I can speak with a QC? In fact, that come out in my appeal because in the defendant's notes, it said that I'd asked and said I want to speak to a QC. Um, and I was sentenced to 13 months in prison. So the first time you went before the judge yeah. and he reviewed the video, did you have your public defender lawyer with you then? No, no, I had no one with me then. So then when you were given this public defender, did you appear before the judge a second time? I did. I appeared before the judge a second time, where um, where the, the, the defence the defense man said that if, basically if he went up and apologised, then um, 
that's it. Henry, we went through previous cases, for example, so that people understand, like Jamie Bolger's killers live under um, a court order that no one can name them. People have named them. They've been before court. No one's ever been put in prison. Um, Rod Liddle, Rod Liddle, who's a reporter for the Sunday Times, he breached a reporting restriction on um, the Stephen Lawrence murder trial. He apparently nearly jeopardised the trial. Um, he was given a fine. No one, if you go through the law, so as well, if you, if you read the law on contempt of court, which, which, which was so disheartening for me, and so I'd been put in prison, I'm sat in prison, I'm reading all of these newspaper reports. Not one journalist, no one, for to go and get the transcripts from that court, to go and find out what was said in that court. Uh, if anyone would have done that, they'd have instantly seen that I did not plead guilty, that I was not given a fair trial, that it was over in minutes. They'd have seen all of this. I thought you had pled guilty because I read that in so many newspapers. I assumed you did, either under bad advice or no advice. Did the judge ask you whether or not you admitted or to anything? Did did he ask you any questions? No, he didn't ask me any questions, no. I did, I did not open my mouth the whole time. Did the judge particularize anything you said or did wrong? Did he say you said this word or you did that thing? No, nothing, actually. What, what it comes out is that... Uh, uh, he, the section four. Section four is the reporting restrictions. So the judge had put a reporting restriction on this case. Now, anyone, again, just go and read the law. It's what I did. I, I, I'd previously gone for days of training on contempt of court. I read the law. The law states that the judge has no power to put any reporting restriction on any information that's already in the public domain. Now, everything I said outside court that day was already in the public domain. Uh, I knew things, I still know things about that case, about results of that case. I still know lots of things that I've never mentioned because I was aware that you couldn't mention them. But the, the judge, and then when the judge sentenced me, so he sentenced me apparently for breaching the reporting restriction, but then in, in his words of what he sentenced me for, which come out in the High Court of Appeal, it was more to do with the fact that I was mentioning that they were Muslim. And it, so it seemed that... And, and he talked about me, the risk of me prejudicing the trial. Well, that's not the section four that he sentenced me under. He sentenced me under basically breach and reporting restriction. And to the, all the people who oh, I read all the things saying I risked the trial, I read all of this. Um, the trial had finished. And bear in mind, I would do nothing. I, I, I wouldn't do nothing that I thought could jeopardise these trials. It would go against everything I stand for and everything I want. The trial had finished. I stood outside court. I made sure that I didn't video any members of the jury, because I, I know you can't, any members of the public. I, I literally, what, the crime that I was sent to prison for was breaching a reporting restriction. And two weeks after I was sent to prison, obviously I'm reading everything, I, I read that the, the Scottish Telegraph newspaper breached two reporting restrictions a week after I went to jail. They, the, the, again, if we go to the laws, the law and the advisory to the government is that they should not send any... If anyone breaches a reporting restriction, it shouldn't even be the individual journalist who gets done. It should be the company they work for. And they strongly advise that all it should be is a fine. Now, as everyone's seen, I, I was sent to prison. Did your lawyer, the public defender who was assigned to you, did he indicate that he had any experience with contempt of court law? Was he familiar with your legal history? No, he just indicated that um, we, don't, we don't want to upset the judge. Did he ask for a delay of a week or two? Did he ask for any time for you to prepare or for him to prepare? No. no. How long were you actually in the court for? Uh, ten minutes. In, you... fa in fact, they were desperate to do it before lunch. Lunch would have been at one o'clock. They were desperate to do it before lunch, but I was still arguing the point with everybody that I wanted to speak to my solicitors. And so it went over lunch. If not, I'd have been sent to prison before lunch, before one o'clock. Did he... and then, you see... they, then they broke for the hour lunch. So when they broke for the hour lunch, I then, then I was um, again saying, I just wanted to speak to my solicitor. Did you ask the judge for a delay or for the ability to speak to your own lawyer? Um, no, I didn't open my mouth. I didn't get a chance to speak. So but you asked the police? I asked the police, I asked the court clerks, 
I asked the, the, the person who come, I pressed the button on my cell, and, which is all documented. Yeah. I pressed the button to come to my cell, I said, I need to speak to my solicitor. I need to speak to my solicitor. Not a solicitor that's just been put in front of me yeah, in, in it for, by, the, by the state, essentially. A solicitor that I trust, a solicitor I know, that I know is going to work for my best interest. That's who I want to speak to. Did anyone else speak in your hearing? Did any court police? There was a picture circulating on the internet of some people looking down from a brick building. I don't know if that was the judge or court uh, police so or that clerk. was the judge and the police that arrested me. So that was the judge. When I was outside court, which I didn't, I wasn't aware of until I come out, that was the judge watching down as, um, and then the police come down and arrested me. Did they say anything in court? No. No, nothing. And then, and then the other thing is, if you read the law, again, I can't believe journalists have not, not done this. If you read the law, the law specifically states that because contempt of court gives the judges, we, there's no laws like this in America and other countries. Contempt of court gives the judges so much power to themselves. They can arrest someone, try them, convict them and sentence them. There's no jury. So you're not, I'm not going to be found guilty by 12 members of the British public. I'm up before a judge, a judge who deems I've done wrong and a judge who deems what sentence he can give me. Now, because of the amount of power that gives a judge, then under the law, the contempt of court law, that judge, under no circumstances whatsoever, that's the wording of it, can put any restrictions or reporting restrictions on the public being told what has happened if he sentenced someone under contempt of court. And that's what happened, though. He instantly made a, He in, instantly said that, 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 that there will be reporting restrictions. No one is allowed to know what's happened. Were there reporters in that courtroom? I understand there was someone from the Leeds local newspaper. There, there was, yes. None, none of them commented. None of them made any comment. None of them said a word, which is why I was sent to prison. And then I started reading that because of some of these newspapers then challenged that reporting restriction right. a week later. Right. What, what, my point is entirely on this reporting restriction. So people are saying that it wasn't a, I, I risked giving someone a fair trial. These reporting restrictions have been put on every Muslim grooming gang trial case. Now, if they wasn't put in place, then every day the British public would be fed the news stories of what these men are doing to these girls. For example, in some cases, they took a 12-year-old girl with a claw hammer when they got her pregnant, they stuck the claw hammer up her and they killed the kid. Yeah? They killed the baby. In other, ca other circumstances, they hot got a hot iron rod and they stamped a young 11-year-old girl on her butt. These sort of sadistic, uh, racially motivated and religiously motivated crimes, the comments, all of the, the stuff from this case would be played out each day. By putting a reporting restriction on the case, which is what they do, you'll have a year's worth of trials. There's another trial starting tomorrow with another 31 people. There's trials going on across this country every week. But they put these restrictions. So then what happens is no one can talk. Yeah? No one can talk about what's happening in court. And they say it's so that the other people can have a fair trial. I don't understand what difference it makes. Now, now my, my point is, these, these laws, I'd say, are, are anti-freedom laws. They're laws preventing 60 million people in this country reading and knowing what's happening each day. Their job is, should be to prevent the jury, the 12 members of the British public. If you need to prevent people hearing and understanding things, it's them. It, when you become a member of the jury, you're told, I've seen it in court many times, you're not allowed to go on the internet, you're not allowed to research this, you're criminally not allowed to look at videos, you're not allowed to look at anything to do with this trial or you go to jail. Yeah? So they're not allowed to. So why are these conditions put on that then prevent daily news stories where we'd be hearing the stories? Basically, they'll lift the reporting restriction at the end of the trial and you'll, you'll get one day's news. One day's news about the horrific torture of hundreds of young children, the horrific... The, the circumstances, the reasons, the, 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 the comments from the men, the perpetrators doing it, all of these things then are put under a restriction from the public hearing. We've recent, and it's not just this, I see that recently in, in London, we had a, a case of terrorism where the public have not been allowed to know at all, which is a national security, what the men were doing, what crime they were what, what, what they're planning to do to members of the British public. Now, so the, I've seen so many things like this where I'd say are secret courts in Britain, and I've seen that in the grooming, in the Muslim grooming gangs or the rape jihad trials that are going on across this country, these same tactics, and I, I'm yet to ask, I've asked, my, I've asked multiple lawyers, tell me, me standing outside trial, 
I made sure to say those men are innocent till proven guilty. I made sure to remain re calm and respectful. I simply asked them how they felt about their verdict. The public watch as whether it be Rolf Harris, whether it be other groups, whenever anyone else walks into court, every time I walk into court, I'm bombarded and I, with cameras and questions and comments every time. But then for some reason, for these Muslim grooming gang trials, no one's allowed to speak. I, I was actually watching your Facebook live stream that day, May 25th, from Canada. Yeah. And I, I remember when you read the names of some of the accused men. And I think you were reading them from a BBC website. Is that I, correct? I read them from a BBC, news, BBC website. There's, a, there's lots of... So everything... I, I just read out. So did, did you tell that to the judge? Because if... How could you reading something off a BBC website that this was being published at the same time, how could that be contempt of court? This is the problem. The judge hasn't told us what, what, what was contempt of court. So he sentenced me to prison without, without needing to tell anyone. Did what you I've done go with. into the trial at all? Did you go and sit in and listen to the trial? Um, no. When, when I got to court that morning, yes. when I got to court that morning, this is the other thing that um, if you read the, the guidelines for the court and for judges, when they put reporting restrictions on a case, they must be visible on the door of the court and they must be visible on the screen. I went into court that morning. I questioned about reporting restrictions that morning. Before Who did you ask? I, I asked the man at reception. He said he, he didn't know. I then looked on the screen, which had the, the, the defendant's names, and there's nothing on the screen of a reporting restriction. Okay? I have a photograph of this. Okay? Then, when he put the report... When he, when he sentenced me, then... And only then, they changed the screen. The reason I asked if you sat in the court yeah. is if you didn't sit in the court, you couldn't say anything that was going on in the court. You were just outside giving general opinions and reading from the BBC. Did you... I don't recall you saying anything that would no, say... So, what, what, so I'm, I made sure that I, d I, I didn't say anything that wasn't in the public domain. Every bit of information I gave was on websites. Now, if the reporting restriction that the police want to put in then they need to go contact the BBC, all the national newspapers. They need to go contact anyone, because any member of the jury, everything I said, any member of the jury could have sat on their computer and read. But the judge has no power to put reporting restrictions on any information. That's the law, which, again, again, I have all these experts and these secret barristers and these journalists and politicians and all of them sending out a generic response that I pleaded guilty, that's why I'm in prison, and I deserve to because I risked prejudice in a trial, a trial that had already finished. The, the, the jurors were there to give their verdict, hand in their, to, to give the result of their verdict. I, uh, I've seen other... Uh, Mohan Singh, a friend of yours, did a video in front of that same courthouse on another day saying very similar things. He read the names also. I've seen other British uh, media have a flurry of interest in court cases really not much different than yours on that day. Did the judge refer to any precedent? Did he, did he say anything about you and your history? I, I, was there anything in that hearing that day that would explain why he had such a fast trial and a heavy sentence given how other media and other citizen journalists are treated? No, what else transpires is that there was in the transcripts because that's what my solicitors were waiting for, which anyone can go get. Again, journalists, you can go get them. Get the transcripts from the court case. You'll, you'll see. You'll see that although he sentenced me and he sentenced me as well for having a three-month suspended sentence, there was no mention of the three-month suspended sentence. He done no research or mention in the court at all of finding out that I was on a three-month suspended sentence. He knew. He knew without me mentioning it in the court. No one mentioned it in the court. He he knew, and I'd say they were already... Well, I know they were aware by comments that were made to me by police officers that the police officer in, in charge of the grooming trial who come to see me after I was sentenced, they knew I was going to be at that courtroom that, that morning. Who's they? You're saying the judge knew? Um, no, I can't say the judge knew. The, the, the police were aware. The court police? Yeah, the... the so, so how... Because the police sees my phone. So... On top of this, what I was arrested for was breach of the peace, and then they mentioned incitement. That's what they mentioned to me. Now, even after I was sent to prison for 13 months, a lead officer from South Yorkshire Police 
come and saw me in my, pri- in my cell and said, give us the password for your phone. And I said, why? He goes, we're seizing your phone. I said, what for? He goes, we're looking at, uh, they were looking at other crimes of incitement. Is that did, did you give him the password? No, I didn't, know. Do you have your phone back yet? No, I don't, know. No, they still have my phone. And Did he have a warrant for your no, phone? No, this is what I said. You, you, I've been sentenced under contempt of court under what grounds? And I kept asking him this, under what grounds? Now, anyone who doesn't know the history, this is South Yorkshire Police. South Yorkshire Police who illegally arrested me and raided my mum's and my, uh, and my house, this is, all, this is all factual as well. They've accepted, they, they sent their police officers on training courses. In 2011, 2010 actually, in 2010, I was due to speak in South Yorkshire again about grooming and about the rape of young girls. This was before it was public knowledge, before everyone knew everything about these cases, before everyone had accepted and admitted that the government and the police had conspired with religious leaders to allow this rape to happen. Before that was all public knowledge, before the Rotherham report, before all these things. South Yorkshire Police, I was due to be talking about it. What South Yorkshire Police did is they sent 30 police officers. I was arrested at the airport. They then raided my mum's and raided my house. They then gave me bail conditions not to, not to hold protests. And the bail date they gave me was to prevent me talking. So I have a long history with this same police force who have done anything they can to attempt to prevent me talking about these issues. So he came... Uh, and he came right to your cell, he did he? he can't, they took me out of my cell to see this police officer. Were he, you required to meet him, or did you no, just... No, no. they said... Uh, and, he's, and they took me into him, and um, he was the lead police officer. How long, did, how long was that meeting? Uh, five minutes. Yes. I just said, I'm on my way to prison. Yeah. Like, what do you want from me? Let me get back to something you said earlier about... Um, you, you mentioned that a year ago, I remember when you were with the rebel, there was a contempt of court case in Canterbury. Yeah. And there was a three-month suspended sentence there. I just want to clarify, are you saying that that was never mentioned in the Leeds court? No, never mentioned. But So, so basically, when I spoke to my, my lawyers, when I spoke to my solicitors, it was... They said on the transcripts, there's no mention of your three-month contempt. So how's he, got, how's he sentenced you on a three-month contempt if there's no mention of it? Sounds like maybe there was some information, some reviewing of information. That wasn't out- said in court, yeah. outside of court, which it shouldn't have been. I don't know, I wasn't aware it shouldn't have been, but from what I understand, it shouldn't have been. Whilst we're on the, the Canterbury court case, because I see so many people saying it's the second time he done it, he's not learned his lesson. Contempt, from my previous contempt of court, there was a young girl who was lost, and she went into a kebab shop and she asked for directions. She was a child. She was taken to a flat upstairs by five men, and raped in every hole she has, okay? Now, they found their DNA. So these men, one of the men fled to Afghanistan, I believe that's where he's from, or, or Italy, but he's from Afghanistan. They, f- they found their DNA. So all five men's DNA were at the scene, on the victim, everywhere, okay? Because she, when she came out, she was distraught. These men were given bail. Now, I was informed of this. I went down to their takeaway, it was called... Say it was, it was called Triple Seven, you know, this takeaway, this, this kebab shop where they raped the victim. I then went, they, they, they just changed the name. And, I, and then I heard that they were still running this shop. So I went and looked at the shop. They all locked, they locked the doors, they shut the, shut the doors. Um, they were still running the shop. I checked the ownership name on the, on the system to see who owns the new company name. It's the same man, the man who's up for raping a child. I then went and spoke with the business over the road. And I, I spoke to... Uh, customers of the business over the road saying, have you seen any young girls in that shop? And they said, yes, there were some, some young school girls in there yesterday. <laughs> or school-aged children in there yesterday. So then, so in my eyes, okay, and in fact in the whole British public's eyes, these men should never have been given bail. Yeah? They should, so I, I know that the judge will not like me for saying this, but the judge left the British public and our daughters and our sisters for too long had they been at risk, left them at risk again. These men were on bail. These men are all now serving 20 years in prison for the rape, but at the time they weren't. These men were freely still, still in mixing with young children. Their, their, pre- their business was still running. They were still using the same premises. And I went down there because I wanted to make a video, which I said at the time, that I want the public and I want everyone in that area to know who these men are and what they're, they're alleged to have done. Now, at that time, I wasn't sure of all the laws of contempt of court. And I went there from my, 
a straight off, a straight from my f full heart that I was, I was angry, I was frustrated, and I couldn't believe what I saw. I saw that these men were still running the business. If there was a chance that they were going to get not guilty, for example, if they didn't have all of their DNA on the young child, right, but they did have their DNA. So in my mind, I I've been remanded. People who would be sitting watching this who get remanded into prison, they don't get bail. Why have these men been given bail? And, and, and in fact, it's been proven that they were all guilty at the time. But the judge took me before... As soon as I went outside the court, the judge let them use the back exit because she didn't want me, she didn't want them to be at risk from me. The five men who have raped, gang raped a child would be at risk from me putting a camera in their face. This is in, so this was the camera. This was a camera. This is when I was working, yeah. this is when I was working with you as well. Yeah. And, and then, you know, the police raided my house the next morning at four, half four in the morning. And I was judged before the, the I was put before the judge. And in my, in my only... The only reason I can see is that she knows that she failed in her duty to protect the British public. She failed by giving them bail. So she took me before her court and she sentenced me. And, and even when I watch that video now, there were things that I said wrong on that video. But I remember that when you were with the rebel, and we had a, a session at a senior law firm. Afterwards, yeah. Kingsley Napoli. And we brought in a lot of lawyers and we went over contempt of court and other things that you as a citizen journalist should be careful of. And so when I watched you in Leeds, I was nervous. I'll admit it, I was nervous. But I thought, okay, he's careful. He's not stepping on the court premises. He's carefully saying accused rapist or alleged rapist. He's not saying they're guilty. In, in, in the training day we spent, in the, tra in the training days we spent to understand contempt of court, which I didn't understand, is you're not allowed to stand on court. Well, I didn't understand at Can Canterbury. You're not allowed to stand on the court property. And so you didn't... That's contempt of court. You didn't in Leeds. I didn't in Leeds. I actually asked the police officer, where's, where's the land lie? And he, he, he agreed. Um, so I didn't in Leeds. I also, every time I, you speak of an offence, you have to speak of an alleged offence. Yeah. No matter how much evidence there is, we, I knew those men were guilty as soon as I knew they did, but you have to say alleged offence. And you, you, you checked that box too. I, I, was, I thought you'd been very careful. I was very careful. So uh, what exactly? So you still don't know what they they put you away for because the judge never said. No, the judge, the judge, to this yeah. day, to this day, you don't know what you've said wrong. No, I have no idea. I have no idea. I'm about to stand a trial again in in a number of weeks. Still today, we have not been told what it is. So I expect they'll throw it on us a, a week before maybe. They'll throw here, here's what we're saying, breached the reporting restriction. And bearing in mind. Anyone can research this. Go, go look up Rod Liddell's case. He breached the Stephen Lawrence murder trial. The murder trial nearly collapsed. The spectator, the spectator run the story. Now, because they deleted it quickly, okay, and because they removed it quickly, he was given um, a few thousand pound fine. But bear in mind that, that this is what their advice is. Their, their advice is that they don't seem, I always say this word wrong, draconian. So that they don't, the government don't come across as draconian, they shouldn't be imprisoning journalists. I've even seen right now there's a massive, um, there's a massive, ne never, contempt of law has been going for 70 years. Never, ever has any journalist ever been put in prison. It was and shocking. I, I want to ask you one last thing about that court hearing, because yeah. you say it was seven minutes. That's incredible to me, given that your video itself was more than an hour. I didn't they, even they, review they the evidence. The I hadn't watched the video. It would have been impossible. It would have been impossible for the judge to have watched the video. It takes an hour to watch the video. And if you watched the full video, it has seen all the all the steps and all the reasonable things I made and said, the, the the different interactions I had with the public. I made sure that I stayed within the law, on 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 what I'd been what I'd been taught was within the law. Now, contempt of court is not a crime. There's no guilty mind. It's a strict liability offence. Either you did it or you didn't. Even if you didn't mean to. And you've already said in no way you, would you want to derail a trial and you said that you would have taken the video down if it if it were to put a trial at risk so there's clearly no guilty mind you obviously did not mean to disrupt the trial am i right of course of course well my understand is that basically so reporting restrictions can be put on and there's no way of anyone knowing where these what reporting restrictions are on and the government were advised in 2014 again anyone who reads up on this can find this they were advised that they must have a national website and that national website must inform journalists so that if i for example i know there's a case starting tomorrow yeah it's at kirkley's magistrate's court it's 31 men for, are going to appear for the first time 31 muslim men 
are going to appear for the first time for another huge gang rape again in, in the same city as the previous 30 that i was reporting on in that same city now there's no website there's no way of checking whether there's restrictions there's no way of knowing yeah now the government were advised to set up a national website they haven't done that i hope that after this they set up a law which would tell the government and the courts so they have to make it visible for journalists to understand what they can and can't say when you were convicted did the judge in any way indicate the difference between being a criminal convict, someone guilty of, uh, someone with a guilty mind who broke the law willingly versus civil contempt? Did the judge differentiate between the two in the sentence he uh, issued? No, the judge didn't mention. So I was, in fact, myself, so for contempt of court, you cannot be a criminal prisoner, okay? You're a civil prisoner. And what, what's the difference in how a criminal prisoner and a civil prisoner are treated? So civil prisoners have more rights. Civil prisoner have as many visits as you want. So you, people can come in and visit you, your family. Every day? Yeah, every day. That re, again, anyone can read these facts. Yeah? Also, they're allowed to spend £50 per week buying food, buying toiletries, buying whatever they want off of the shopping system within the prison. Also, so for, for, for my crime, for the crime of contempt of court... Not it, even a crime, though. No, not even a crime. It, you go to an open prison. So you'd be in an open prison where you go home at weekends. Yeah, it's a, it's a Category D offence, a completely minimal, completely zero-risk offence of, of contempt of court. That's what the guidelines are. That's what the criteria is. That's how a prisoner should be held. So a civil prisoner gets as many visits as he likes, gets to spend £50 a week on whatever... You can buy food, shopping, and also... And how far does £50 go in a prison? Is it cheap? No, it goes quite well. So the, di the difference, here's when we get to the difference. So I was put into prison and I was held as a criminal prisoner. Now, people may think that was a mistake, yeah? I was held as a, criminal, as a criminal prisoner, even though I can't possibly be held as a criminal prisoner because it's a civil crime. Even though, which we have all the evidence of this, my solicitors made the prison aware instantly he's being wrongly held if you're not... If, like, if you're holding him as a criminal prisoner with... Because I, I was only allowed to spend £12 a week. And we'll get to yeah. why that's important in a minute, why spending money was important in your case. But why don't we pick up from when the judge issued... The sentence, 13 months. Were you shocked? Yeah, I, caught, of course, uh, yeah, I was gobsmacked. I was gobsmacked. But I was gobsmacked, but at the same time, um, at the same time, for what has happened over the past 10 years with myself, it's not... I know, I've known, and if even if in the most recent demonstration when we had a day for freedom in London, I was saying, and I kept saying to everyone, I wonder what they're going to do next to try and stop because they can see anyone can see the momentum building the public are not listening anymore they're not yeah. buying the media sp spin on things they yeah. they they they're seeing the reality of the problems the country faces and the attempts to make me the most hated man in britain have completely failed and i i, I was worried i was very worried i've been very worried about what they're going to do next i'm very worried now about what they're going to do next because they're in, uh, and when I say they, I'm, 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 I mean the government, like, even, um, well, I was sent to prison and I got 13 months. And my previous prison sentences, like, in 2012, I re received a, a 10 month prison sentence and it was for illegally entering the United States of America. Now, again, everything I've done through my activism, if it's morally right, if I believe I'm morally right, I believe boundaries need to be pushed. To, I, I believe that if the moral argument, and, and it's a moral cause we're fighting, I, I, knew when I, I knew when I went to America, I knew what I was doing was, was legally wrong. But I felt that I had such an important message to give America, to give the American public a, a warning to America. I wish, I wish that someone would have come to this country 30 years ago would have told them this is what's going to happen i'm telling you because i've lived through it i've watched my town i've watched the left 
align themselves with the Islamist groups. I've watched them join in order for the vote bank of politics. I've watched the, the decay of freedom. I've watched all of this growing up in Luton. So I felt when I went to America, that was an important message to give. Now I legally entered America. I, I, I again, I looked at previous people who had used illegal um, documentation. For example, Abu Qatar to come into Britain on a false passport. He was not put in prison. Okay, I spent ten months. I was put in British prison. America did not prosecute me. The British authorities pr prosecuted me. I had not actually broke a law in Britain because the crime I committed was in America, but they remanded me. I was remanded instantly. So I was held on remand for three months before I got before a judge. So, and I was put on solitary confinement. I spent I think, 22 weeks on solitary confinement. I was, the legalities around that, anything over 28 days is detrimental to your mental health to be isolated on your own. Now, I was moved from Wandsworth, not far from here, prison here, then to Bedford prison, then to Woodhill Prison, then to back to Wandsworth Prison, then to Wayland Prison. And the whole entire time, I saw no one at all on that entire prison sentence. I did not come out of my cell. Now, when I come out of my cell, and I've never spoke about this publicly, because, and the reasons for it, when I come out, I struggled big time. I come out after five months of, of sitting on solitary confinement, and I come out just straight back into society and, it, and, and, and I struggled I struggled to cope a lot and I went to doctors and um, I was diagnosed with having a post-traumatic stress disorder now the reason why I never spoke about it publicly was because it's embarrassing post-traumatic stress disorder is something that men who fight wars get I'm locked in a room. It's, there can be no comparison in what those men are suffering for me to publicly try and talk about that. Well, the, the difference is this is done to you by the British prison system yeah. on purpose. Oh, uh, on, on purpose, undoubtedly, because they're not allowed to do it. They're not allowed to do it. But anyway, this, this, was for a more, this was for illegally entering. I spent two days in New York. I gave a speech where I wanted to warn America, and I spent, I spent five months in solitary confinement. Now, I, went, I come out. Of prison and I, I went to prison in 2014 for, for a separate offence which was for a mortgage fraud, a supposed mortgage fraud which again I'll get into this in a little while but when I went in that prison sentence I was locked in a room and had uh, and was beaten with locked in a room with Muslim prisoners and I was beaten I, that's, I, I've got all new teeth all my teeth are new because my teeth were smashed to pieces um, and but I wasn't put on solitary confinement yeah so I was then moved, I was put into a, a jihadi jail in, in England where I lasted five minutes before I was violently attacked and battered and then I was transported black and blue to another prison but the next prison I was transported to has a very low Muslim demographic. I spent the six months of my prison sentence uh, as, a, as a role model prisoner um, in a, with, with Muslim prisoners but I, I was no risk to them. Um, but. On my health records, which everyone, which, which the prison system have, which the government have, they, they know the long-term struggles I had after solitary confinement. Now, this prison sentence, I land in HMP Hull. Now, I was worried when I went to prison because I was in Leeds, so I thought I'd go to Bradford, is one of the biggest Muslim populations of our country. I thought I'd go to that prison. I was put to Hull um, because that prison was full, I believe. I was taken to Hull, and then I was put into normal location, which is what I want. I, what, we, what I wanted, I wanted to be treated normally. I was put into normal location where I spent two days, and after two days, I was in the prison. Prisoner guards come to get me and said, "You're being moved." Now I believe this at the time. Lord Mal, Lord Lord Pearson had wrote a letter demanding my safety. Which I was grateful for because because I was on the I was on this indu induction wing now so that people understand when you get to prison, if you ask for protection, if you say I'm scared I need help, yeah, then you'll be housed with the paedophiles. Yeah, I'm never going to do that, ever. It's never ever going to happen. Yeah? And, and they know that as well. So I would never do that. So because I've done nothing to deserve that, and I'll end up hurting one of them. So. That's never going to happen. So I was put into normal location. Now, when I was on the wing, there were some Muslims there. And I did sense that possibly, look, it could turn, it could turn violent. But there was, so people understand, out of a wing of 100 prisoners, there were seven Muslims. 7% yeah? of HMP Hull 
is, a, is, is Muslim. Now, the prison themselves made the decision to put me in the hospital. Every prison has a hospital, or well, this prison had a hospital. They put me in hospital where there were no Muslims, and I was separated completely from the prison population. When I had, when my family got finally in to see me after three weeks. Three weeks? Yeah, f after three weeks was when my, my family got, in, got, got a visit booked. Well, let, let me ask you about that. So, so all in the course of a few hours, you were arrested, tried, convicted, sentenced, and shipped off to HMP Hull in, what, five hours? Five hours. Well, less, it was less than that, because by the time they actually, yeah, it's less than When was the first time you talked to your wife? <laughs> So they give you a they give you a pound phone credit when you get to jail. So I rang I rang my wife at that point. So that night? That night, yeah. She must have been shocked. First thing I asked her is, "Have you had enough yet?" And it took three weeks for her to be able to visit you. It took three, and then they you have a visit in hall. Now the prison made the decision that it was not safe for me to have a visit in the visit in hall. Probably right, and they ha so I had a private visit, um, and I had th that was when I, s I sent a letter out, and so I got my visit. My family visited me on the Sunday. On the Friday, I had my legal visit booked, where my QC and my solicitor Carson K were due to see me. So this is still at HMP Hull? This is HMP Hull, and this is for the appeal. Because, obviously, bear in mind, I know what's gone on in court. I've explained it to my solicitors. My solicitors have then contacted the court for the transcripts from the court. The court didn't give them the transcripts. They give them half of the transcripts. So my solicitors still were, were in a position where I'd, I hadn't met them personally. I'd only spoke to them via the video, because in, in the prison you have a video link so you can talk through the camera to, to your solicitor. So I'd spoke to my solicitor. I said, I want to appeal. Obviously, I want to appeal all of this. Yeah. I can't believe what's happened. Um, so my, my finally, the date set for my, me to sit down was I'd have been in jail a month. But, and the date that I'd have been able And the reason for them not being able to sit down was because the, the court had not given us all the information. So then... I got, they were coming to see me on the Friday. My family visited me on the Sunday. Monday morning, and, and can I, uh, whilst I'm at... Like, I've been in five prisons before um, in previous years. And Hull, generally, was a prison where the prison staff ruled the prison. Not the prisoners. The prison staff. And the staff were absolutely... For, for, because I was isolated from the prison population, the prison staff would open my door for two hours a day, and I would spend two hours a day interacting with them. Now, bearing in my, my concern the whole time was how I spent my sentence in 2012 and the long-term effect that had on me. You mean by being in solitary by confinement? By being in solitary confinement. The psychological effect, is that yeah, what you mean? Yeah, the psychological effect, which you don't realise at the time. I didn't realise at the time. So you were in the hospital wing of in, HMP Hull, yeah. but you were there by yourself. Yep. And I was... So I, 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 I was... Because they could section off the door at the other end to the other prisoners. So I was allowed out for two hours a day where I interacted, like, like we're talking now, with the prison staff. So and, no and other prisoners but prison staff. Yep. And they were friendly yep. enough? Absolutely brilliant. Outstanding, actually. So Doing a difficult job. Did, did, did you have a chance to do any exercise? Or yeah, to and for one hour... So every single morning, they'd open my door... And there'd be a in the hospital. There'd be a little room which would have um have a like a little mini gym. So I'd be allowed to use that every morning. And then they'd also for an hour and a half a day take me outside, where I'd sit in a garden, where they'd sit and have their break, or I'd sit with the prison staff again. I'd sit and socialise and talk to the prison staff, which um, ideally I'd have rather just been because so that people understand as well. I had a TV this whole time, yeah. So that people understand the British prison system. When you go to prison, every prisoner is given a TV. Every prisoner, okay? You have a TV in your cell. Your cell door would open at approximately eight o'clock in the morning. You'd get a job, you'd go to work. <coughs> you'd, um, your cell door would lock about six o'clock in the evening. So you'd be out of your cell, you'd be working, you'd be interacting. You, you, we, they, you'd have pool tables, snooker tables, uh, football pitches, you'd play football. That's the prison system, yeah? That's Just to... 
keep you in a routine, maybe give you some skills, earn some money. So it's, so it's, it's, a, so regi- it's, so regi- it's a regime. Everyone has to have a prison regime. That's your re- general regime. My regime was very limited whilst I was in the hole, but I wasn't complaining, okay? Yeah. Because I was safe. Um, I was still interacting, so I, I thought... I'll be all right here. Yeah. But, but you were I, the only civil prisoner in Hull, I bet. Is that right? Yeah, I was right? the only civil prisoner. Yeah. I mean, the idea, if, and, and Hull, Hull were made aware, because my solicitors made them aware, that actually you have to let me have a visit each day. And actually, what? Because out, so you understand, twelve pound a week. Now, it didn't. It wasn't a problem at Hull because. At Hull, they'd take me out of my cell. I'd go to the canteen and I'd I'd see the prisoners who were serving the food, and you pick your food and they give you it. So I'd see, visib- I'd, I'd visually see my food. So it was like a cafeteria, like a cafeteria. and you take your tray, take your tray and food. they scoop the potatoes and they scoop things like... And then you put it into your cell. Now, so you would eat as much as you felt like and, and you would see the food right before your eyes. Yeah, fine, yeah. I'd see the food, so I, I knew nothing could be done to that food. And I didn't have that worry. And then um, and out of my £12 a week, actually, whilst I was in Hull, I'd spend £12 on the phone so I could keep in contact with my family so I could speak to my wife my children and the reason we're talking about food and interaction with other prisoners and um, safety yep. and money is because HMP Hull which you say was passable you were suddenly and without explanation moved is that correct so uh, as I say, my family saw me on the f- on the Sunday. Yeah, um, they went away from the meeting happy because they, I told them I'm fine here. And you, you saw your kids for the first time then too. Yeah, because and, and b- because when I say I'm fine here, prison staff were the ones who locked me previously in a sentence in a room and allowed me to be violently beaten. Right. Now in Hull, my family, my mum wrote a letter every single day to the prison's minister, every single day detailing. Your, uh, the, what she feared they were doing to me, yeah. what they were, she feared would be allowed to happen to me. Actually, she didn't whilst I was in Hull. When it, it was when I got to Only, but when I saw when I saw um, when I saw my family, I made them aware. That, look, I'm fine, yeah? I'm, and I made, I made sure the, the word went out that, that I'm okay in Hull. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine here. I'll, I'll, I've got six months to serve in prison. So it was a 13 month sentence, but you thought you'd be out in I six. I thought I'd do six and a half months. Um, to serve and and I relatively thought look I'm, and I'm going to have my appeal process I'm seeing my QC on Friday Hull at the minute everything no no one knew I was in Hull really like the others no one saw me in fact no one saw me I was not visible when I went and sat in the garden no prison prisoners could see the garden I didn't see other prisoners really so it, it was when I had my visit it was on the on the unit the hospital unit now Bear, my, my QC is due to see me and my solicitor on the Friday and on the Monday the day after my visit um, they just come in at first thing in the morning and said get your stuff packed you're going and did I, they say where you're going to no they wouldn't tell me so it was a big secret where the, the, they said we're not allowed to say and then all the staff who had been holding me in, on the unit were all as surprised as me because they were like they, they, were, they thought to have you in this prison and to have you safe and to have it calm and to have no problems. That's a huge success. Massive success for the prison system. If the goal was is the rule of law. Well, the goal wasn't that. Safety. The goal wasn't that, which we've established. So, so everything was going with obviously no complaint. I mean, you didn't interact with anyone. You were just. I didn't put in a prison complaint. I didn't. I, I actually asked people publicly to stay away from the prison, uh, to not protest the prison. Um, that I was being held in, in fair conditions. So everything was fine. I mean, because oh, was... obviously the prison, the prisoner put in the position, the prison's governor is as well, which he made the decision to put me on the hospital wing, and that's because he has a duty of care for my that's safety. That's probably a good decision, is what you're saying. Yeah, I'd say, yeah, yeah. I, I'd say, going by my previous prison sentences, where I basically fought my way through them in different prisons. Yeah. Um, look, he done what he thought. He he, he, he done the, what, what 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 would limit um, violence. Yeah. against me you shouldn't have been in there in the first place since you weren't a criminal prisoner but given that you were wrongly put in prison that was as good as it was going so to you get. can still be a civil prisoner held in criminal ah, prison okay. held in prisons okay. but what it means is so you could you can be in there but what it means is you're you have more rights okay so because you're not criminal you meet your family on the sunday 
in five days you're about to meet your lawyers for the first time to go through to to go through our appeal to get basically to get me out but instead the day after you meet your family you're told you're moved and just so you know, so, so, so my, my, my appointment's booked. I've been given the appointment slip. So the prisoner are aware that my QC and my defence lawyer are coming to see me on the Friday. It's all booked in. Um, I previously spoke to them three times via a video in the prison. Yeah. I'm then moved to HMP only. And anyone ever explained to you why? No. No. Still, to, in fact, when I got to Onley, we'll go through what happened. When I got to Onley and I'm asking the, the head governor of the prison... Why have you took me here? He said, it's above my pay grade. That's all the answers I've got. It's above my pay grade. Do you believe him? Um, I believe that, yeah, I, I believe that... It the, wouldn't, wouldn't have been his decision. It's obviously. not his decision. No, it's come yeah. from above them. Um, I, like, so I, I've been moved to Onley, and, and the, the prison staff who dropped me there, they took me in a taxi. So the prison staff who took me in a taxi, so they put me in a taxi, handcuffed to either one, and they sit. And the prison staff that are taking me there, I'm saying, like, Look, I know Onley Prison. Onley Prison is a London catchment. So everyone who goes to jail from London, we know the demographic of London. Everyone who goes to jail from London, London has the biggest Muslim population of this country. Yeah? Everyone who goes to, Lon to prison from London, Onley is one of those catchment prisons. So I didn't know the demographic facts at the time, but yeah. I knew it would be heavily populated with, yeah. with a Muslim population. Yeah. Um, so I kept asking again, is, What's been sorted? Has something been sorted? And they said, oh, it would have had to have been. There's no way our, our governor could have agreed with that governor. Yeah, that wouldn't be for them to decide. No, it would, it, it, they would have had to sort something out. And this wouldn't have been for the judge back in Leeds to decide. He wouldn't... I was that, out of his hands and he sent you to prison. This would be a decision made by the prison authority. Prison authority and the head of the prison authority, which are politicians. Yeah. Essentially. So, basically, and bear in mind, we all know... Now, what had what fuss had gone on outside of prison in the first three weeks of my prison sentence? You're talking about the Save huge Tommy. demonstrations, a free Tommy, free Tommy campaign. So this was punishing you, or it looks like, at least, to punish well, you because the, there was grassroots support. Well, I don't, oh, it looks. Yeah, it, it looks like um, it looks like it looks like they weren't happy with the fact that I would have been able to serve a, a fairly normal prison sentence. Mm. So I was taken from one of the lowest Muslim population prisons in the UK, and I was put in HMP Onley. Onley has the highest Muslim population of any CCAT prison in, in the UK. OK, so you arrived by taxi. Now, you, you told us that at Hull, you were in the hospital wing. No one even saw you. Yep. Your only interactions were with the staff. Your cell door was open a few hours a day, exercise garden. Mm phone calls. Tell me what it was like going from Hull to Onley. So I'm booked in, I get to reception of Onley, um, where you, you assess, where you have a talk. Um, I asked them, I guess you know who I am. They said, yes, we do. I said, okay. So what's been sorted? Has anything been sorted? Where am I, where am I going in this prison? And he goes, oh, um, you're going on to the induction wing. I said, okay. Like, I was surprised. I said, OK. And then they sent the governor come in. This was the number one governor. That's, that's what we would call a warden in the North America. Ward, the person in charge. Yeah. Person in charge come in. Um, I made them aware of m my concerns at what I thought the prison system were doing. And, and tell me what those concerns are. My concerns were that I think they've intentionally taken me from a place of safety. And they're now going to have me killed. And what did he say? He said, um, you're under the name Yaxley Lennon, not Tommy Robinson, you'll be fine. Oh, my God. Yeah, th th that's actually what I'm dealing with. Like, like no one will know who I am. And oh, my God. Uh, now, did he say it with a straight face? Or no, he was said, that... no, he said it with a straight face. And so, and, 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 but then it's like, then he said, obviously you're aware. And I said, I know the size of the Muslim population in this prison. And he kept say, saying, like, his robot programmed spiel of we are a prison with a large diverse population oh my God. Uh, i said no 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 you're a prison with a large muslim population and it's not diverse in fact you, you, you've got a large muslim population and the diversity of the prison is not my problem okay i, I don't care if, if the prison was 100 percent black and you put me in here yeah my problem is that you have a large muslim population and statistics and facts show that a certain percentage of those people outside of prison if we look at outside of prison 30 percent of 
British Muslims believe that someone it, it, violence is acceptable to someone who's insulted the Prophet Muhammad. Thirty percent. You go in the prison system, the violent radicalization, pr pr radicalized prison system with violent offenders. That's going to rise. So, so I, I'm in a bit. So, I, 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 so, so then he said, well, what you need to do is you need to self isolate. Yeah. So I've, I've then said, well, I'm not going to self isolate. Now, what, what he wants me to do is willingly isolate myself. So when they put me on the wing, willingly keep my door locked and refu and say that I want to self isolate. I willingly want to be isolated. Now, I'm not going to do that because I know what six months of being isolated is going to do to me. Yeah. yeah, I'd rather. And then he said his comments are, you'll be in danger, though, if you go out of your cell. Because I, I said, I'm not going to self isolate. And he said, you'll be in danger. I said, I'm in danger every time I walk out my front door, I still walk out of it. Now, I'm going to you put I said, I'm going to walk straight out of that door. And whatever, and I'm going to, I'm going to defend myself in any situation. Um, at which point he said, well, I'm going to put you down the block then. I said, can I, and I asked again, what risk assessment did you do before you brought me from the lowest Muslim population prison to the highest? Yeah. And why have you done this? Yeah. Then I'm taken straight down to the block where again, so people are aware, I didn't ask for isolation. I've not asked to be segregated. I was happy for them to open my door, okay? N not happy in the sense that I probably would have been killed. In fact, every member of the staff at the prison told me from that point on, you'd have got murdered, man, What, like, if you'd have been out there. You'd have been killed. So all of this, because of... It's, it's 30, so out of 100 prisoners on the wing, over 30, averaging 30, are Muslim. Let me ask you just for a second about Muslim gangs in prison. Yep. Many of the people who go into prison convert to become Muslim for protection. Is that a fact? Yes, yeah, so these 30% statistics, 30% of all these Muslim, that's not including anyone that's converted while they're in there. Um, I spoke to a prisoner who was down the block who had been beaten, beaten so bad, boiling water put over him um, for two hours, beaten by Muslims in the prison because he was having bacon, because he had bacon on his life. So and I, where was the prison staff? during this turning a blind eye the only many prisons as, as i said Hull was a prison that was run by the staff only in fact a government a government investigation into only not my this is not me saying it anyone can go and read this government report said it's violently unsafe it's dangerous um when we look at the radicalization within prisons we know that muslim muslim gangs have taken over prisons Okay, this is not me saying it again. These are government reports. It sounds like they enforce halal pretty uh, well. That's pretty it. Violently. You, you'll, you'll stop ordering bacon. Ba many prisons just to prevent this have just took pork completely off the menus. Most prisons now you just don't get pork. You're not allowed pork. So the only still has pork as an option. Yeah, but obviously a lot of prison people you've got to be pretty brave to order it. Is there is there a rival gang to the Muslim gang? No, 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 no. They're, 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 no, they because. The Muslim gang is so large. Anyone who converts to Islam, this way in, in the British prison system, so many sex offenders and things like this just convert because no one will give them violent, ha violent attacks or hassle because they're part of the Muslim Brotherhood. So if you're a, if you're a Muslim, you're safe. What you see, English lads, white English lads are all converting. We, the, the most weak and vulnerable people in our society, who have usually been wronged their whole life. When you sit down and speak to most people in prison, if you if you went and stood outside a prison, get a prisoner coming out and ask them their life story you'll see that they've been wronged. They've been wronged in growing up. They've been wronged by the system. Whether they've been abused, mentally or physically, sexually. Um, and then you have these people who have so much anger, anyway, at society, uh, 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 being let down, many, many of them. When you hear, when you actually hear, because I've, I've, I've done it each time I've gone to prison, I speak to people and see the opportunities they had were pretty low. And then you then have an ideology that will take that anger and direct it and you'll become part. These people haven't had a community, haven't had a belonging, haven't had a path. Islam gives them all of that, and very dangerously. And and that's why. And most of these people aren't converting. I've had these these arguments with many of them within the prison system. They're converting to a gang. They're not converting to a religion. It's amazing that the governor of that prison is such a fool to think that that you wouldn't be recognised. Oh, he knew. That he, be... he, but basically, when I go through this, he, they wanted me to self isolate. Or they wanted you to get killed. To get killed, yeah. Uh, what, what, what else transpired was that, which I put this complaint in, 
to the prison was that the imam where so basically i got taken to the block of the prison the block is a punishment area of a prison it's where i spent five months in 2012 in different prisons now the block is usually in the basement of a jail usually okay underneath the prison let me stop you there why what are the other options you mentioned there's a hospital wing in hull no there's nothing in only so it's I asked that. what is there besides a block nothing just normal wings uh, Got it. So, no, no, so normal prison, normal prison wings where you come out of your cell at eight in the morning again, where you have a TV. So you were instead of the normal prison wing, you were put in the block, which is a heavier. I was taken straight to the block where anyone who, if you stab someone in prison or you attack someone or you rob someone or you're violent to staff, you then get taken from your normal prison location and you're put in the block. So that's not even regular criminals. Those are criminals who then reoffend in prison. In prison yeah. So you're not even supposed to be treated like a criminal prisoner in the first place and now you're being treated as a criminal who is offended again well, you, you'll see it this time so we're not so bearing in mind again the thing that was one was frustrating me was i'd come from hull where i was fine yeah and here i am now and i'm taken down to the block of the prison and as, as i'm walked into the block the other prisoners who because because nothing happens down there you're locked up all day as soon as the noise comes, people look, are looking through the gaps in their doors or the gaps in their, wi their window to see who's being brought down, what's happened, yeah? So I'm brought in and instantly, instantly it erupts with there was, a, and I made all, the prison were aware of this anyway. So I'm then put in my prison cell with a blue mat. And again, I say, okay, so you're putting, you're making the decision, not me, you're making the decision that you're putting me down the block because you're saying I'm not safe. Now, what, what's the symbolism of the blue mat? What do you mean by that? So you don't have a bed. Is it like in prison cells, look, look, you don't have a bed anyway, a normal bed. You're in prison, yeah? You have like um, a prison mattress. But in, in the, in, wait, and you, ha you also have a TV and you also have a wardrobe and you also have a table and you also have a chair. You have all these things, yeah? Now, down the block, you have nothing. You just have a blue mat because the people who are down there it's basically a smash proof room it doesn't have a normal toilet it doesn't have any it does ha it has nothing that you can smash that you can't break anything yeah so just you, a blue mat and this is right away your first night in in onley yeah. you're being put into the block in a place where a violent murderer who killed someone else in prison in the yard this is this is the worst place. This is the punishment. This is the pu uh, But then even, even the prisoners that do that, they're still only allowed to spend 14 to 28 days maximum down there. And how long were you down there? So no, in this case, I'd, a week, yeah? So when I, when I went in there, I went in, and then one prisoner in the cell next door to me spent the entire night smashing and booting my, my, my wall through like he was going to come into my cell. I reminded him that he's in prison, and the prison walls probably dealt to deal with that. And then... So I spent the first night down there. The threats are instant. Um, there was a prisoner called Khan who shouted straight away, there's a price up for me to, to get me set. They're all shouting and, argue, and amongst each other. I'm then taken the next day. I get 30 minutes exercise. So that people understand, you have prison windows here, prison windows here. Here's the entrance. So I'm taken out of my cell, and for 30 minutes I'm put in this cage. I'm put in a cage for 30 minutes where I walk around the cage on my own with all the other prisoners who are in the block looking at the cage. So hang on, so, so this is not in a gym or a yard. They've just made a little there's gerbil a trap for you. There's a it? cage that, yeah, there's a cage which is for where, for where you walk around when you're down the block. So it's just, so this is not a normal exercise facility it, and- No, no, no. And you're on display for all the other prisoners, is yeah. that right? You're on display for the other prisoners who are down the block. So this is inside the prison? Yep. It's basically ringed by... It's ringed by a big, huge fence. So and it's, like a thunder, it's like the Thunderdome in Mad Max. Yeah, yeah. You're in the center of it. And you just... So you, and bearing in mind all of the shouting, all of the abuse, all the threats, which, look, I'm used to, yeah? I'm used to this. You surely can't be used to 100 men screaming they're going to murder you. No. Is that what... Well, let me not assume. What were they saying? So, so your it, it, half it, it, hour... It took, them, it took them a few days to get my family's names. So, okay, but they knew you right away. They knew me straight away. So this fool governor, oh, you're Stephen Yaxley. Yeah, I, I, so the next day I sat before the governor yeah. and I said to him, your staff will tell you how this place erupted last night when I come in it. Your whole prison's erupted now because I'm in it and they're all going to kill me. You would think he would want to get you out of that prison. He said, he said, um, I don't think, because I said, 
is your intention? Because one point I kept making, yeah, was about TV. Now, the World Cup was on, started. England were playing. I, I'm, my rights as a civil prisoner should be a lot more, visits, money, etc. Instead, I'm being held in this condition where I've got no TV, I've got nothing. For 30 minutes a day, I'm put out and paraded around all of the other Muslim prisoners that are in there. So the 30 minutes isn't even a relief. It's an, 30 minutes of abuse. Well, on that first day, which, again, I was, I've sent you this form, um, I reacted, and I say Islam is a cancer, and I got arrested for it. Hang on a second. You got, a, you got arrested yeah. for saying, for criticizing the religion of Islam. I said Islam is a cancer. Well, I actually said Islam is a cancer and I am the, I am the cure. But I said that in... Uh, bear in mind, I've, I've, I've waited. Is that a crime? What were you arrested for? No, I was arrested for religious and racial hatred. Now, I want to And ask, again, I've got, this, I've got this arrest for but, but let me stop you there. <coughs> you, you said the very first night you're in there, your neighbor's trying to... You're, the, for the whole night, he's smashing smash he's through. Kill me. A guy named Khan is saying there's a price on your head. Were they arrested? No, no one was arrested. When you go into the cage and for a half hour being screamed at... Tell me some of the things they said to you. Everything you can think of. Well, I want to hear it. Just, just that I'll be killed, that I'll be murdered, that um, my family will be murdered. My, just comments about my wife, comments about my family, about my daughters. Um, Any arrests? No, no arrests, no. Any, no, no were, I, they, were they locked down? Were they shut down? No, when I, when I got before the governor the next morning, so when, when I was called in to see the governor, I said, one man spent six hours the whole night last night and again, my, 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 my stress with it was that I was fine in whole. You've now purposely taken me to a prison yeah. where they, they, they can then use the threat against me to put me on solitary confinement and surrounded by people who want to do me harm. So, so your comment about Islam being a cancer, not the most polite thing to say, but I would imagine it's a gentle reaction compared to the death threats. Very calm reaction. <laughs> wait, 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 wait. But, and, and so that's what it was? It was a reaction to them screaming at you? It was a reaction to just... Uh, I, I, so so who, who, who called the guard on you? Was it... A prison... No, so a prison governor heard. So basically, I get this, which, which you can include this arrest form on, on, on the video. I'll give you the arrest form. It says, um, at, at this hours, and it gives the hours, I heard Yaxley Lennon shout... Islam is a cancer, and I am the cure. So the governor himself heard that? One, one of the prison staff. Gov so the we prison, call them all governor. So the prison staff heard everything before that and was fine with that. Which this, is, re this really is. The, which, the, which was the point. So I, I thought, OK, so now, if I don't want to face further arrest, I just have to remain silent whilst all of this is going on every day. What happened after? I mean, you're in prison already. What are they going to do? Have a... They, they, they give you extra days and things like that. So I, I, asked, the, I asked the governor. So when I, when I went before the governor, I said, I want to speak to a solicitor about this. Yeah. And I asked the governor, are there blasphemy laws in this prison? Like, and what's going on with all the threats against me? How come no one, are those people being disciplined? And um, I never heard another word after this. Did he, did he answer those questions? No, he said, you've asked for your solicitor. This will now be adjourned. So it's like, it's like a little mini court hearing. Yeah. They adjourned it. Um, I then spent a week where, after the first day, it was a Muslim who was bringing me my food. So th this is where it changes. Yeah, you talked about in, in Hull, you would go cafeteria and you'd say, give me some of that and give me some of that. Mm. And you could see the food was the same all the other prisoners had. And they tell me what it was like in Onley. Well, I'm not allowed out myself. So my, my food would be brought to me on a, on a tray with my name on top of it. There's your food. And it would be prepared by Muslim prisoners. The, the, a prisoner from the normal location would come down to the block to do the food. It was a, a black lad who was a Muslim. Um, within a day, I was, how's your dinner, Tommy? How's your dinner? The shouts coming from the other prisoners. The shouts? Why would they say that? Because they, because, like, I, I know, especially in this prison as well, um, anything can get smuggled in. Most prisoners have mobile phones. Yeah? Weapons. I saw through my window crack another prisoner being beaten with a bar like this big. Yeah. I, so this sound, it sounds like a chaotic, wild place. It doesn't sound like it's governed at all. It's not governed. Um, the prisoners so, governed. So law of the jungle. So I, I watched as this was. Uh, uh, so I know that now that I'm in this prison system, now that now that I'm in Onley and my food's being brought to my cell with your and, name on, and comments are being made already, laughing about uh, how was your dinner, Tommy? Did you enjoy it? Laughing. So, so I didn't. I said, I'm not eating. Yeah. What did you What did you think could be in it? Well, if I was in, 
You can get anything smuggled into prison. Anything you want. Yeah? Poison? Well, you can, yeah. You can get rat poison. Easily. It's only that big. Yeah. Now, I'm not going to sit and keel over in my cell and give a victory away like that to people who, who, who despise me and want to kill me. For when I, when I when again, I should have £50 a week to spend, but I've only got 12 And so is that your own money or money? No, my own money, yeah. Money that um, people send in. So 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 when you say you, you're, you should be allowed £50 a week to spend, you're only allowed 12 that's even your own money, and that would be to buy things from the prison from the prison shopping list. Shopping list. So I, I bought again. I've said I've got the receipts of what I bought each time. I bought um, five tins of tuna, and I love you card to send to my wife. Um, two packs of Space Raiders, and five pound phone credit. So how much tuna? You said five tins of tuna. Is that per week? Yeah, per so week. So like one tin a day. One tin a day. Now that. That's not a lot of energy. That's not a lot of vitamins. Did did you have anything else? No. Fruit. Water? Fruit. Yeah, fruit. Water, fruit. Fruit and water. So for the first week, I didn't eat a single thing. And the prison were aware I didn't eat a single thing. Because I, I had no tuna. Because you, to get your forms, you have to... To get your forms, to get your canteen, it, you're a week behind. So I filled out a form when I got there. And then a week later, my tins of tuna would come. So for the first week, I ate not a single thing. Did you have water? I had water, yeah. Did you have any fruit? Um, no, but because you can buy fruit on your canteen as well, and then you get fruit. As so, you, basically, you fill out your week's food, and then you get it the next week. So now, if you, if even, you, the, even the meals. Did did so, the prison say anything? I mean, if you were on a hunger strike, or if you were your health was in jeopardy, I mean, not eating for a day or so, but not eating for a week. They took me after after one week. So one week I haven't eaten. The reason I haven't eaten because I can't eat anyway. So they've took me to see the governor, and the, and every day I was putting in complaints saying I believe, which people have read and they've been mocked. Yeah. I believe I'm being mentally tortured, and the reason I'm saying that is because I know I should not be behind my door 23 and a half hours a day. I know I should be getting a visit every day. I know I should have 50 pounds to spend. I know I should be able to eat, and I know I should not have been moved from a safe environment. Again, journalists should be asking the question. People should be asking the. The, the prison system should have to answer. The government should have to answer. Why was I moved from no problems and no risk into the biggest Muslim population of the country? Why was I then put into a position where I was paraded for 30 minutes a day amongst them? Why, was, why would I be... I spent non-stop threats. Now, after one week, I had no TV. So, obviously... I'm just sitting in a cell listening to all this. I can't, I can't comment because I've been arrested in the first week for commenting. So I, I put in these complaints saying that this is... This is and, and, and again, you have to understand that my main concern here is I know I've got six and a half months to do and I know what I was like last time. So I know that if they're going to hold me in this room like this for the next six months, I'm not going to come out in a good place. Yeah. And, I, and I, was, I was really worried about that because interacting with my kids and family and everything was affected when I spent the last solitary confinement. So all of these things were worrying to me. I, I also knew that my appeal date, obviously, I'd missed my, obviously they'd moved me, so I hadn't had my meeting with my lawyer. So, so how long was it before you even met your lawyers? So then it was... An, so once they got me into H&B on, H &B only, my lawyers were trying to make an appointment... It was at least another week. No, it was another... So the appointment was meant to be Friday. So it was another week before I got to see my lawyer. That's a month. Yeah, at least. A month. Yeah, at least. Now, I understood because I was there at your court of appeal hearing. Your lawyers said that when they tried to meet you, the meetings were either cancelled or, sh or shrunk to less than an hour. Is that true? So they struggled to get... They, they, they were get, trying to get the meeting, which they weren't being responded to, and then they finally got the meeting. Now, when they had the meeting, it was a two-hour meeting to see my lawyer. This is the first chance I've, I've got to go through now, like, to go through the case, yeah? And um, I'm sitting there. My, my meeting's meant to start at 2 o'clock, my legal meeting. My lawyers got to court, got to the prison at 1 o'clock, so they got there an hour early. It's meant to start at 2 o'clock. I got brought in at court past three. And this is all, this is, like you heard my QC in court. My QC has said he's never experienced this. What is going on? So what excuse was given? They don't have to give an excuse. The same way when my, so we, my, when I was held for those first seven days without a TV, in sol down the block, my lawyers put in a letter saying, just to give you prior notice, we're, we're putting in for a judicial review. We're going to take you to court. Um, they have 28 days to respond to any letters. So they don't have to even reply for 28 days. So... 
And the, the TV thing, I saw uh, the mainstream media was mocking that. It's not because you want to watch sports necessarily. It's because you're in a, it's you're in a room with sensory depri- deprivation. Is that the reason you need a TV? That's my guess. Is my, that- my, my reason A was um, the World Cup was on. Yeah. yeah. So you do like the sports. I, I love... I, I'd usually have been at the World Cup. My also other reason was I'd just spent... Um, I'd had a TV for the first number of weeks in Hull. Um, my, my main reason is that, look, lock yourself in a room with nothing at all, yeah? Nothing at all. Nothing, Yeah where you only come out of that room to walk around a cage on your own for 30 minutes a day, do that for a week, yeah? All right? A day, go, a day goes like a week. You have no interaction or knowledge of what's going on really in the world. You, um, you, you're not speaking to anyone. You've got no one to talk to. It, so, would, it would drive you mad. So, yeah, so, so I, I know that six months of this... So in my, in my complaints, I'm saying, look, give me a TV. At least give me... And, and, and here's the other... And 750 prisoners are in Onley Prison... And every one other one of them has got a TV. Including the murderers. <clears throat> unless, unless you're down the block. Yeah. When you're down the block for punishment for 14 days, you don't have a TV. So what, what I kept saying is, you're, you're punishing me now, which you are, <clears throat> because you can't keep me safe. Now, I didn't bring myself to Only. You brought me here. You must have done a risk assessment before you brought me here. You must have... Uh, so, and then I was so... In the- have you ever been given access to your prison files? No. We're trying to get them now. We're still waiting. We're trying to get my uh, blood samples to show how malnourished I was. Let me ask you about that. So, you didn't need a, a bite for a week. I didn't even need a bite for a week, and then the, and then the prison governor, the number one governor, asked to see me. And when I saw him, he asked, "If we move you cell, yeah, so from the block to a normal cell. Now, in a normal cell, they're just better cells. They're bigger. You have a window that opens this much instead of not all, yeah." In the block, you don't. You when the window doesn't open, yeah. So you have a window that opens this much. Um, you have a bigger cell. You have a more comfortable bed. You have a desk. Um, things like that. So if we move you onto the wing, the normal wing, um, will you eat? Yeah. And then he said, you need to sign this disclaimer. And he gave me a disclaimer which said I would be self-isolating. So I, I then again said, so he's extorting you for food. You're seven days starving. Yeah. He says, I'll give you food if you sign away. That, so that, then, I, then I said, I've told you already, I'm not self-isolating. Yeah? He then said, well, you'll stay down here. I said, well, I'll stay down here then. I'll stay down here then. But obviously you're aware, I, 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 until I get my canteen, I can't eat anyway. Yeah? Um, at which point then he changed the disclaimer and he rewrote it where it basically said, we will move you to another cell, but... You will not be able to integrate with any other prisoners due to the stability of the prison. You will not be allowed to work. Now, when we, this is where it gets quite key. Look, well, when we're on about £12 a week, what I can spend to have enough to eat. If you can work in prison, like everyone works because everyone gets a job, you can spend another £12 a week. right? And then you can get enhanced where you have good behaviour and the prisoners see you behave well. You then become enhanced where you can spend another £12 a week. So... But bearing in mind I'm a civil prisoner, undisputable, no one can say I'm not civil because the crime is civil, I should have £50 a week, I should be able to buy food. I wasn't. I was then, once I was moved to the block, once I was moved from the block, people were saying, oh, he, you wasn't on solitary confinement. I was then moved to another cell where I was not allowed out of that cell once, yeah, that the condition that I had to sign if I wanted to be moved was that they were forcefully isolating me, which I wanted it to say, because I wanted it to I'm not isolating myself, and that was a key point for me. Yeah. I'm not isolating myself. You put me on that wing, I'm coming out. Yeah? And whatever happens, happens. And if I get killed, I get killed, because you've, you're doing that. And I'm not going to... And, and I don't know if it's my own... Like, part of my own... Um, I, I'd see anything else as being, ca- being a coward. Yeah? And, but I know I'm going to get killed at the same time. So I, I'm not going to ask for separation. And... I'm put, they, they've then put me there. They've, they, they've then isolated. And in the form that I had to sign to get moved from the block, it said, um, which again, this is public, it said that the only time I'll be allowed out of my cell is when the rest of the prison is locked for lunch. So between half one and half two, <coughs> I'll be taken from my cell, escorted down to the block, back to the block. Back to the block. Where I have a shower and I walk around the cage again. Now, li- these, are their own, these are only little things, yeah? But... Not little things. <clears throat> my wife and my my wife's at work and my children are at school, between half one and half two. 
So essentially, I can't speak to much of kids now. Now, what, what's frustrating is all around the prison, all you ever hear, see and read about is mental health, A, and keeping prisoners in contact with their family, which is super important if you don't want them to reoffend. All of these guidelines and things they try to do. So there's like posters, posters, and whole, whole massive like brochures, whole massive cyst campaigns. Yeah, psychologists. Yeah, whole whole campaigns. Did you see any psychologists? The during... first day I got in there was the mental health were there with the governor, where I expressed to them. Did they say a word? No, I said to them everything I'm, I think you're doing and the reason I think you're doing it what I kept asking why have you taken me here yeah. you're going to now hold me on solitary for six months I know what you're doing Yeah. they then told me you won't be here in a week specifically said you will not be here in a week who said that? the governor he said you will not be in on leave for you a week you won't be in on leave in, in a week's time so yeah. then I think okay I'm getting moved I never got moved did these so called mental health they advisors come saw, they come and saw me the day before I went home ha huh. and what did they say there? I told them again I, I need to be out of my cell. Yeah. And, and, and then, so I, I, I wrote complaints after complaints after complaints. One of the complaints I said is that for an hour a day, just let me on the field. Yeah. Let me run around the field. And um, again, it, I felt like everything was dangling a carrot because then they replied to the complaint, which I've got, saying we are going to do that, basically. Yeah. They didn't do it. Yeah, they right. never done. Now, so, so not once did I come out myself. Now, once I got put onto the wing, into the wing location, this was obviously... Again, my, my cell location, which I think is quite important. Um, anyone can check this. I was in cell H wing, which is induction wing, cell nine. <laughs> I can show you an overhead view of the prison because I've done it on Google Maps to show. And then directly opposite my window was the industrial unit, which I've said was a mosque, used as a mosque. It is used as a mosque. On a Friday, it's a mosque. On a Sunday, it's a church. Now, every, so every prisoner in that prison who's Muslim will walk past my window to go in there to pray. Yeah. Now, it, this is when you're in the block or no, when you're when in the I, wing? when I got moved onto the wing. Okay. Now, the thing that they made me sign clearly stated that if there were problems when I'm on the wing, they would reassess my security situation and basically put me back down the block. Yeah. Where in the block, there's no electricity. So the reason they're saying we're not giving you a TV, even though there's a t there, is electricity, there is a TV point, they're saying the electricity is not working down there yeah, for TVs. That's what they told me. So, um, yeah, so in my mind, I'm going to be put back down the block. So, when I got put on the wing, I had Muslims prisoners at, at, Muslims at my cell door constantly. Some of them, there was a lad from Brixton, a uh, lovely lad, who, who wasn't, in fact, was saying to the others, just leave them alone, yeah? But, other, but the majority of the time, it was just threats after threats after threats. And my window... Did anyone stop them, ever, from coming to your door to issue threats? No. Never? No, one of them was moved. So one of them in the cell opposite me... <coughs> was moved. Now, this was a prisoner who came to my cell and told me that he had a message for me from Saiful Islam. And who's Saiful Islam? Saiful Islam. Saiful Islam means Sword of Islam. That's his name. Um, he's in jail for ISIS terrorism. He's the leader of a terrorist group in Britain called al -Majradin. Um He was the second in command of that group. He's from my hometown of Luton. He's physically had run-ins with me in my hometown of Luton. He's like the leader of the radical Muslims in Britain. And he was passing a message on to me. Uh, of things that were going to happen to my family, yeah. Now, I, can you say any of them here, or would it put your family at risk to say it? Um, he knew things. He knew things about my family, like location or names or ages. Uh, he or... knew names. He knew all the names of my of my children, of my family. Um, and I then, so the prison, and, and he told me he come from speaking from Safe Islam. Now, when I saw the female member of staff, there was a, one member, a female member of staff. I said to her, "Look, I'm a bit concerned now." You know, this isn't normal. This isn't because I was getting spat through my window, shit come through my window. In the end, what I did on my, on my window was I just shut my windows. Yeah, after the first couple of days. Okay, so when you say spat and and human excrement, yeah, that's because you were on the outside. My, my, so my cell, my cell, my, my bed's here, um, my bed's here, and the windows here. <clears throat> the window, the bed isn't. You can't move your bed. It's that's where it is. And the windows here. Now both the windows are, they only open this much. Yeah. But you know the boiling, well, the boiling summer we had in Britain. I had my windows open, and um, and within a few days it was clear that I couldn't have my windows open because of the shit and spit and just people at my window. Now, did you have to be on the ground floor across from the There's mosque? Three floors. I could have been on any floor. Did you rec did you bring this to the attention of staff? Um, no, I didn't. No, no, I did. They, the staff were very aware of the threats and the things coming out the window, but I didn't ask for a move 
because I didn't want to put, put down the block. Ah, I see. It said clearly at the bottom of my thing. If, yeah. if, there's, if there's issues with you on the wing, you'll be put... It, it said it clearly, which, again, people can read. Now... Would, was anyone ever charged <laughs> for throwing things through your window? Oh, no. no, of course not. But this then kid, this prisoner, who yeah. gave me the warning, the prison officer went and checked, and he had just come from a maximum security prison um, where this prisoner, where Saif al-Islam was being held. So, so it was a credible it, message. It was legitimate, yeah. And what happened to him? They moved him. They moved him, eh? So that's... Did they move him down the block? No, no, no. No, so, no. so you can be a messenger with a death threat to from someone's family from a terrorist, yeah. and your punishment is you move to another cell with a TV in it. And then... And, and also, if you complain about it, you're down in the block. Yeah. And then... And then, and then so when I said... So... I mean, I'm, I'm on complete isolation anyway, yeah? I'm taken out for 30 minutes a day where I'm walked down. I wrote my wife a letter in this... Um, in the first week I was in H&P only. And it was an... Uh, it wasn't a letter to go public. It was a letter for me to detail... Detail a lot of things I, ne I needed to say to her. Because cause to be honest, in that first week, I generally... In that first week, I didn't think I'd make it out of there. And, I, and in fact, I thought, I know what their intentions are now. I know what's gone on in my previous sentence, sentences. So I, I wrote her a letter, basically apologising to my wife. And it was me apologising, not for anything I've done, but for the situation that she finds herself in, that we find ourselves in. And then and I also, and, and that reason it was, to explain it, it was important for me, say if I got killed in that prison sentence, there was a lot of things that I hadn't said that I needed to say, especially with regards to uh, just with regards to my wife and, and then to my children. So I wrote three individual letters to my children where I wanted to say to them, Joan, the thing that was killing me most was that if, say, say I got killed and they grow up without a dad, then they'd be angry at me for thinking that I didn't care about them. I, yeah. I've done this last time, man. I didn't care about them as to why I done why I do what I do, and so I, I individually and, it, and I broke my heart to write it, and then they didn't send it. They held back the letter. Why did they do that? How do you know that? Because they they give me a form and they and they give me a form saying the letter's not being sent because they think it's going to end up online. What, what difference does that make? It's your letter. They think it's going to end up online, and and it is um. And the, and the, and that and I know that may seem like a little thing, but it, it, it knocks you because it's I, like a last will and testament. Tell, can you can you tell me what you said to your wife? To Is it wife, too personal? No, nah, to, to my wife it was apologies. Look, there's been times over the last years where I haven't been living with my wife, where I've been living at my mum's and things like that, where um, I've made mistakes even across my marriage, and yeah, and it was just and then it was apologies about about. Because everything that goes on with me, you, I, I may be serving a prison sentence. She's serving a sentence on the out, and then and then also this, the letter I wrote pro, was prior to the police going to see my wife. But it was then just just things to tell my children about about their characters. And, yeah. Did you did you tell these things to your wife after you got out? Did you say them to her? Yeah, yeah. So 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 it's not. It, and even with my kids, it would be that it would be trying to tell your wife, or you're trying to tell your wife, which I've tried to tell her many times, that this isn't about my kids, yeah? This isn't about our kids. This battle is about every single child and the next generation of children across this country, even the people who hate me, even the people who despise me, even the politicians. It's about their kids and their kids, and, and, and it, it's about everyone's kids. So this goes beyond the need of my children. The need of my children, yeah, I should shut my mouth and just be a dad. But it's far bigger than that. And, and, and what is... And, and it, essentially, it's like, if we remain silent, if we ignore and we, we don't stand up to the blatant wrongs that we can see, to the blatant dangers we see our country in and our families in and our, and our communities in, if we don't, then essentially, if there's going to be a battle and someone's going to have to put themselves up, then let it be me, not my son. Then, then, so I could, and, and trying to explain that to your wife, who's not politically minded or doesn't really, all she cares about is being a mother to the kids and our kids. She doesn't think deeply about, she doesn't view the country. She doesn't, or, or, do you know what I mean? It's like, uh, tro, 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 so it was to put, a te, it was a 10 page of me, not just breaking my heart. And I actually said in the letter, this isn't a suicide note. I know it reads like it because I, because I generally at that time, I'm thinking, why have they moved me to this prison? 
they're going to let them have a shot. Yeah, I found out that the imam, well, the prisoner who who works down the block, when I spoke to him, he said, when, when, when I was going out in the exercise yard, he said, I knew three days before you got here he was coming here. Mm. I said, how do you know that? He said, the imam was telling everyone. So then I'm thinking, so the Muslims have, in the prison have had an opportunity to prepare themselves. When I previously got violently beaten in prison, I was locked in a room. I knew that those Muslim lads didn't know I was going to be locked in that room, yeah? because <clears throat> I could tell by their faces. Now, if you give someone an opportunity, then they're getting nice, then they're getting blades. They're gonna be ready for me when they get that one opportunity to touch, to, to have a swipe at me, they're gonna get it. So I, I, I'm weighing all that up and I'm thinking that of why I've been moved from one prison to another. So I, I'm generally, I don't think I'm coming out of there. And there's a lot that I, there's a lot that I wanted to say, or I want to say, not just to my wife, but to my children. And then when they stop the letter, it, 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 what was the reason? The, it would end up online. What is that going? What is, what is, what law the, does that my previous, and, and then my lawyers have contacted the prison then, saying give us a copy of the letter, which they didn't again. And then, and then, so then, yeah. So when you were in HMP Hull, when you were in the hospital wing in the safer prison, you yeah. did write a letter. I did, yeah. And I know it got through because I saw it posted online. I wrote pretty, yeah. So I wrote, I wrote a letter. I didn't. Say, so I wrote letters to my wife from HMP Hull as well i wrote her a brief letter but it wasn't a letter because i thought i looked around and thought i'm all right here yeah, yeah. so when, when i was in only in that first week i thought i'm not all right here. so they didn't stop <coughs> your letter at hull no the one that was online and was incredibly touching i want to remind you of something mm. you said i mean you had a lot of sense of humor in that letter you talked about how donald trump jr mentioned your case and, and you, mm. you joked that was worth the whole thing but you also wrote about your son and I've had the pleasure of meeting him. He's just like you, Tommy. Yeah. And how he couldn't understand what was going on and how he wanted to go to to do something bad so he could be put in prison to be with his dad. And I heard from your wife that he slept with an old shirt of yours that hadn't been laundered just so he could smell his dad until this the scent was gone mm. after weeks. What did you say to your kids in the letters? So the, the letters were just to talk about them, uh, just to talk about, to, to also, I, I wouldn't want them I, to, to try as children, to, so they under, yeah, I can't. <laughs> just for them to understand that Everything I do, I do it because, yeah. Do they understand what you're doing? Do they know about these subjects? Have you kept them shielded from these I kept them, I've kept them shielded from knowing, knowing the severity of the risks, of the threats. For example, when I was in, when I was in Onley, free, my door opens. And again, this is, my door opens at about nine o'clock at night. Where's your wife? How, how am I meant to know where my wife... In, the only time who, I... Who asked you that? Three members of prison staff. Now, bearing in mind, the only time I'm allowed out of my cell, they've specifically made it so it's not when I can ring my wife and children. So where's my wife? And I said, I don't know. They said, the police are trying to find your wife. I said, okay. And um, I said, why? And they said, there's intel that she's going to be attacked with acid. Now, and then they shut my door, basically. That's basically it. And what then... A and then I said, do you know where she is? And then they shut my door. So then, to say I, I, didn't, I didn't sleep a wink, man, and I'm waiting and waiting. And then, but then the, the, That's the, not a genuine question. That's a taunt. Yeah, the sickening thing is, is, like, so basically, my wife get, the police knock on my wife's door, and they give her a little leaflet of what to do when you're attacked with acid. Oh, my God. You've got to see the leaflet. It's oh so my. pathetic. Which police force was that? Bedfordshire Police. And, 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 and then... Two days later, three days later, they go to my mum's and they do exactly the same. What to do when you're attacked with acid? Oh, uh, 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 is call the police on the list at all? Oh, no. One of the things is that um, you cannot get weapons. You cannot have a weapon to defend yourself. So basically, you cannot break the law. One of the thing guidelines is do not break the law. You know? So, so, uh, so then basically, I'm sat in prison thinking my wife's going to get attacked. All right, or my mum's going to get attacked because they went to my mum's two days later, and and then I have then I have the mental pull of, is this even real? Because or is this to mess with me? 
is this to psychologically destroy me yeah. whilst holding me on solitary confinement, whilst putting me in these positions, and then the fuck, so the first then, the, the opportunity I then get to use the phone when I do get hold of my family, you can imagine my, my wife's situation of how she's feeling. You can imagine the stress and, wo and worry about all of that. And it's just like, so, and, then, and then the whole time I'm, I'm reminding myself that I'm in, I'm in here for standing outside a courtroom and, and telling people the names of men <clears throat> who, again, I can't comment yet legally on what happened at that trial, but of men who are alleged to have raped up to 100 young children. And, and I'm a civil prisoner and I shouldn't be in it. I shouldn't be held in these conditions. I'm not eat, I, I can't eat. I then put in forms. I put in a complaint saying, look, if you make me enhanced, yeah, I get an extra £12 a week. Then I can buy more food. Yeah? Do you know what they replied? <coughs> I've got the copy of their response. They replied saying, we have to see your good behaviour. Oh, my God. Right? To, make you, to make you enhanced. But because you're not out of your cell, we can't see you behaving well. And it's like, are you for real? You know, I know there's a phenomenon here in the UK called cage prisoners. It's all these former Al-Qaeda yeah. prisoners from Guantanamo. Oh, they have people queuing up to defend them. This is the other thing that was so disheartening for me. I know what's gone on. I know it's a kangaroo court. I know I've been illegally imprisoned. I know everything that has gone wrong. I now know that my rights are being trampled over. My human rights... My, my, uh, we talk about contempt of court. I, I mean, I'm, in court. I were, I, I'm supposedly in prison for contempt of court. We're sitting outside Westminster... It, it's them who have the show are guilty of contempt. They're yeah. guilty of contempt for civil rights, guilty of contempt for justice, guilty of contempt for free speech, guilty of contempt for democracy and the most recent things. And I'm sitting in prison, knowing all of this is happening, knowing all of the, every single day, the threats, the threats, the threats, the, the constant, which, which isn't a situation that it had to be. All they had to do, which my solicitors wrote to them, as soon as they moved me to Onley, my solicitors wrote and said, move him back to Hull, he was fine. <laughs> Do you know what they said, mm. which I've got again in writing, is that for them to move me to a prison that matches my racial, prejud my racial prejudice, yeah, would be immoral and illegal. Oh my God. Right. So, so, so to put me in a prison which has the most, and, and bearing in mind that when I put my complaint in, one of my complaints said that seven percent of the whole was uh, Muslim, thirty percent of only is. I feel like you've purposely endangered me. Their response was. If you speak negatively about our Muslim population again, yeah, you'll be on the IEP system, which is again arrest. Yeah. Now, they're the ones, HMP only and their staff and their governor are the ones that said I wasn't safe, not me. Yeah. They're the ones that put me down the block and held me on solitary confinement because they said that I'd be violently attacked, not me. I didn't, it's not, it's not what I've done. I didn't isolate myself. <clears throat> they then held me for months probation come to see me so a week before my appeal a week before i had my appeal i had a probation officer who had been to see my wife and assess my home for my release from prison um and then they come to see me where they informed me that one of my conditions because my hdc which is where you're released on tag my tag date was coming up in september tag is what you call tag bail here in, tag uh, is where you have an electronic tag around your ankle and you go home. And so basically, if you get a 30 month prison sentence after three and a half months, I'd be let home where for another three months I'd spend where I have to be in my house between seven and seven. Right. So seven o'clock at night and seven o'clock in the morning, you have to be at home. So probation, this is then the probation service. So they come to see me because right. they were assessing my property. Right. They went to meet with my wife and my family and um, about me being released on on, on tag. They then told me that my condition, this is where it becomes very apparent what all of this is about. My condition upon release will be, I will be banned from the internet. <coughs> banned from using the internet till June 2019. How, what does that have to do with... Now you, you tell me, yeah. Ezra. You know, you know my previous prison sentence when I was leading the English Defence League, yeah. my condition, which was for legally entering America, my condition then was not to contact the EDL. So... Anyone, anyone who wants to sit and say that this case, this current case, is not politically motivated, that means that they'd have to accept, they'd have to accept, for it not to be politically motivated, they'd have to accept that the judge, by accident, incorrectly, a judge of 30 years or whatever, a top judge, would not realise that he has to ask me if I'm guilty or not guilty, would not have to tell me what I've done wrong, would not have to let me speak to my solicitor, 
would they, so then they don't have to buy into that. They don't have to buy into the fact that the prison accidentally hold me as a criminal prisoner, not a civil prisoner. They then have to buy into the fact that just by accident, I was moved from the safety of Hull into HMP only and put under all of these conditions. They then have to see that it's normal for someone to be banned from the internet. Yeah. But that would put you out of business and it would shut you up on a hundred other matters is what ir it, ir ir unrelated to this court case. Which is what all of this is about. Who, who would have drafted that, that tag condition? Who would have... Well, who's the, who's, who's the probation service? I don't know. Uh, run by the government. So just the internet completely. Because, yeah, I've been banned from the internet till, till, till June two thousand. That's what this is about. This isn't about you standing outside of a court case. This is about you having any opinions on any matter whatsoever. It's about them silencing and stopping, which is something they've had a tactic to do and tried to do for multiple years now. If I sit here now and and to be honest, Ezra, I come out of jail. Clearly. I'd lost a lot of weight. I put, I put nearly a stone back on. Well, I asked you. I, you told me when you went in, you weighed up, I'm going to just say it in pounds, yep. 190 pounds, and you came out just over 150 pounds. What's that in stone? How do you say it here in the Three UK? stone. That's not healthy to lose that much weight through no, starvation. Yeah, of course not. And it's not healthy. And I also know the worry in my head the whole time while I'm in there is I know what I went through 2012 when I come out of prison which I never spoke publicly about, because, again, it's quite embarrassing. Even even now, I'm not, I'll am not. i never compare it to anything anyone's been through at war. It's, it's nothing like it, yeah? It's nothing like it, but it, it is purposely done. Everything that's happened with this sentence, the isolation, the purposely putting me in a position where they can say, because of his safety, we need to put him in solitary. Because of that, the threats to my wife, the, the police visits, all of these things um, that I'll say are purposely done, I, I knew... Like, I'm a lot better now, even now. I, 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 when I come out of prison, I went straight on holiday for two weeks, yeah? I went straight on holiday, which meant I didn't have to communicate, really talk. I just lay by the pool. And I spoke to people, a couple of people that were other families on the holiday. Um, when I come back from holiday, I, went, I, I, I took my kids out. And, and this is the... Do you know the most, that most thing that angers me, frustrates me, is that if you put something in front of me, I'll fight it. Yeah. Put something there and I'll fight it. it. And that's what I've done for 10 years. Whenever they've knocked me down, I've got back up and carried on fighting. And then what they've managed to do, I come out of jail, I've gone away with my family, I know I'm not right. I know at the time I'm not right. Yeah? When I saw you the night you got out of prison, yeah. you looked you looked shaken. I was shaken. You I was shaken. My, my speech... You weren't yourself. You, no, you, you weren't yourself. No, and and it, even now, now I know I'm not, I'm not myself, yeah? I went to come out of, and I tried to go to watch. I went to watch Lou and play football, and I took my kids. And because I, because I, I, I knew even even when I was in prison, I know I have to get out of myself. When my visit that family come to visit me by the end in HMP only, I didn't want to see him. Huh? Now that's that's messed up, yeah. Yeah. And I, might, I would have butterflies for f five hours <clears throat> before going to see my own family. Yeah. And, and I want what? And in the end, you don't want to come out of yourself. So where is it at first? I'm complaining and arguing. Get me in the gym. Get me this. Get me this. By the end of it, yeah, you're just laying you're on a bed. Vegetable. Yeah, and, and so I know all these things. Every single day, every opportunity, I've, I've done my 30 minute. Um, well, there was four times in one week where they didn't even get me out for the 30 minutes. Hmm. Every every Tuesday, I wasn't allowed out at all for 24 hours. Yeah, Why? because there was a judge doing adjudications and they were too busy down the block. Super. So every Tuesday, but. So I know I need to get out. So when I come home from holiday, I thought, I, I need to get back into the, the system. I, I want to get back out there. I went to a Luton Town football match. I left at half-time. It wasn't it weren't just because we were losing. It's because... And I was supposed to have my friends come around to watch the boxing, which I cancelled. And it's because I weren't right. I, I know I'm not right. And, and do, you know how, do you know how upsetting it can be when I think that they've got away with doing it? Losing that kind of weight, not on purpose, but because you're being starved... That's a medical, that's a medical extreme condition. Did any doctors prescribe you supplements, vitamins? Did they take tests? Nope. Did you, were I had you blood, examined? I had, blood, I had a blood test. I told every member of that staff how concerned I was about my weight loss. And they must have seen, I was shocked when I saw you when you got out. I couldn't believe all it. All they had to do, all they had to do was make me enhanced. So I've had another £10. Another £10 would have been another six or seven tins of tuna a week. And, and what do they care? It's your own money. But did a, doc, did a doctor ever see you? So a doctor took my blood tests. Um, so what I sense is that when I went to court, so basically 
bearing in mind it took them f a couple of hours to send me to prison. I've then gone before, it took me two months before I can get back into a court to see a judge. Now, when I went before the court, the High Court, um, the judge heard everything, yeah? So he knew how wrong it all was. They still kept me in prison for another two weeks in solitary confinement. I did, he, he could have released me, he should have released me on bail there and then. So when did the, when did the, the doctor take your blood? The do so when I come back after that court case, so because, what? because I think in court it had been made public about my health, about my worry, about my concerns, uh, about my, my solicitor's concerns, then they, and then, so a day before my, a day before my verdict, a day before my verdict, the mental health team come to see me and they took me for a meeting <coughs> where I sat before the mental health team where I said to them, like, I can't do another four months this, yeah? Like, so it was only when your story was told in public court did a doctor... They, they would have seen you wasting away, but it was only when the public court... He come and took, he come and took blood examples. Did he ask you any questions or did he just take blood? Did he ask you... No, they asked me questions. Every time I spoke to him, I told them, you need to get me out of this cell. Did, they, did he give you any diagnosis? Did he give you any prescriptions? No. Did he say, give this man more food? No. Did you ever see that doctor again? No. Are you sure it was a real doctor? No, so uh, I don't know. I don't even know if it's... A, so, Maybe it's a nurse or... A nurse or, or someone on their rounds or someone who works in the prison in the healthcare. Have you ever got the results of that blood test? No, my solicitor has been trying to get it now. Did you go to a doctor once you got out of prison? Yeah, I did. That'll be interesting to see. You're, but you put 10 pounds back on? I put 10 pounds back on... Um, I've been so I've been to see a, doc, a doctor, a Muslim doctor, a lovely fella. Um, he so I've been to see him. He's he di he's diagnosed me again. It's it's an embarrassing thing because I'm not going to sit here look and say, Joe, it's actually it's embarrassing, it's humiliating. It's, it, 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 it was done to you. It winds me up because they've been allowed to do it, and and it's and and it didn't have to be this way. No one can justify it. it, it can, no one can answer the question. Do you know the media? All of this can happen, all of this can happen with the full support of the poli every single politician in that building you know, and every single media outlet, not one, not one media. When your letters, begging for food, begging for some social interaction, asking for just a simple TV, when those letters were obtained by the Daily Mail, instead of writing about your abuse, they mocked your handwriting style. They said that it was a handwriting of someone who was insecure. Well, you were Wouldn't insecure. Wouldn't you be? You, you, you were I was surrounded physically. by people who were threatening me every minute of every day. My wife was under threat. My mother was under threat. I'm held... I knew, I knew in conditions... That I was, look, it's, it's 2018. You would not hold... You, you would not be allowed to put a dog in the position they put me, treat it the way they treated me, without the RSPCA coming and doing yeah. something. You shout at a dog. You, you, you starve a dog. You give a dog no exercise. You put a dog in, in, in a box in that heat. You're exactly right. And it's and it's um, everyone who's I'm seeing these human rights lawyers. Everyone everyone fell over each other and pushed each other out of the way to give hit piece after hit piece to BBC, Channel Four, Sky News. They all done big hit pieces on why I deserve to be in prison. Yeah. But I remember they had a human rights lawyer on explaining why you ought to be in prison. Here's the thing. What are you talking about? Human... Even after the Court of Appeal quashed the original sentence and just devastated it in five ways. They they, they, I, they didn't just sit on the... You see, now I was worried. When I was in prison, I didn't believe. My solicitor's telling me, they've got to let you out, yeah? And I'm saying, they're not going to let me out, right? I know they're not going to let me out. So br briefly, in 2014, my mortgage fraud trial, when I got myself together recently, I spent £16,000 with a QC to go through my mortgage fraud trial. Now, what they found, just like this case, yeah, was that it was all unlawful, OK? Now, w we went to the Court of Appeal, the same Court of Appeal that let me free. Six months prior, we went to the Court of Appeal, where they heard the case <coughs> where it was put to the court. Now, the Court of Appeal judge and the prosecution, all three, my, all, all of them, read the law and said, yeah, it, it, this is all unlawful, yeah? Now, the Court of Appeal judge said that 
it wasn't enough of a miscarriage of justice enough for him to grant of appeal because we were out of time of appeal. Yeah? It wasn't. Now, this was a case that I was sentenced to 18 months in prison and I had to give the police £125,000. At a time when, when they got me in a position I had to give them £125,000, I was offered deals by secretive units within the Met, the Met, called the Met Intelligence Bureau within Scotland Yard. The deal would be that I would work for them in uniting the right. Yeah, I would be an undercover agent for the security services and then they wouldn't have to pay the 125 grand. Now, what it turns out when my QC went through the case was I never had to pay the 125 because it was all unlawful anyway. Now, the judge agreed in the Court of Appeal, I've got it in black and white writing, that it was all unlawful, but he didn't warrant, he didn't give the justification. So I haven't had the money returned to me, which I should have, and he didn't rule it unlawful because he didn't, for, for him to give an appeal, because we're out, out of time of appeal, the only true guideline is it has to be a huge miscarriage of justice. He doesn't think that four and a half years time you have a yearly wage and a fine by the police just to put you in a position to, 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 to have you try and work for them is enough. Now, so bearing in mind, I, I knew what had gone on in the previous Court of Appeal. Well, I, I had no confidence that this Court of Appeal judge would do what was right. And in fact, I still believe that they, they would have done everything to try and find a way not to do it, which is why I wasn't instantly freed when it was heard. It's why I spent another two weeks in solitary confinement. And not just two weeks, they had until the 1st of August. Yeah? What date did the appeal result come? on the 1st of August. They maximised the amount of time I would still be held under those conditions. Now, I'm sitting here now, I'm still having to seek um, medical treatment. I'm still, I face another court trial now on the 27th of this month. For the exact same matter in Leeds. The exact same matter the in Leeds. The Court of Appeal didn't have to order that. The, the Court of Appeal didn't have to order it, and in fact, when they did order it, <coughs> I never thought they'd go through with it because I thought this was just to save a bit of face because obviously it's been proven of what they've done. The whole world's watching. Now the headlines aren't Tommy Robinson freed and, and quash, conviction quash. The headlines are Tommy Robinson to be retried. I thought, I get it. They're, they're saving a bit of face. Now what it then turns out is this has not been bought... This, this case against me has not been brought by the Crown Prosecution Service, which is the normal procedure for crimes in Britain. If there's a court case, the CPS are the people, they're an independent organisation. Yeah? They're the people that say, OK, there's enough evidence, they're independent from the police. Because they have to look at the police's evidence, they have to act independently and say, OK, there's enough here to warrant it, let's try them. Yeah? This has come, the CPS have actually said, we want nothing to do with this. This is the Attorney General, the, the government... This is the government who are ordering a retrial. Now, what they're saying by retrying me is that they don't think the two months, two and a half month prison sentence I've served, the two months on solitary confinement, the treatment, they don't think that that, that warrants enough of a punishment for standing and talking, not inciting. And to anyone who says I was jeopardising the trial, the trial had already finished. Yeah? The trial had already finished. Um, these laws that are being used on the Muslim grooming gangs, I think that we should have journalists challenging these in courts of law. Yeah, why? The, but the journalists are, are not challenging them. They're not standing up for, for free speech or journalist rights. They're actually happy to see. They were all. They were all ecstatic to see me imprisoned. Not. A, I, I saw some of your supporters writing to Amnesty International and other groups like that when you were in prison, and I it was copied on the replies. They would say, "Oh, it was." Uh, it was nothing to do with free speech or human rights. It was a violation of a court order. But now that the Court of Appeal has proved that false, you would expect Amnesty, Reporters Without Borders, all these civil liberties groups to speak out now that you've been vindicated by the Court of Appeal. Dead silence, not just from them. Where, where are the liberal journalists who would say, well, I disagree with Tommy Robinson's style, but this is the UK and we don't send people to prison for 10 weeks for... Well, we've, no, we've, we've never sent a journalist to prison. Well, like, where, where since it, 70 years of contempt court. Where's, where are those people who used to stand up for well, I, civil liberties? I, again, as, as I speak about Islam, and that is so terrifying for anyone to be seen to sort of side with or, or, or take up my case, that they all run a mile. You've seen yourself. How, many lawyer, how impossible was it for, to find a lawyer to represent me? We went through seven law firms before we found someone who would represent you in Canterbury. And it's because they're scared. Seven law firms. We're almost out of time, Tommy. I want to ask you about two positive things. When I, when you were in prison, I, I didn't speak with you, but 
I, I spoke with your wife occasionally and other family members, and they would pass on news to me. And your wife said to me, and I took it seriously, that two things void your spirits. And I'm asking uh, on behalf of our viewers who support you, your wife said the two things that gave you encouragement were the letters you received via email and knowing that there were supporters around the world who were rallying in London and cities around the world and covering your legal fees for the crowdfunding. Why don't you tell me about both of those? Because I saw that picture of you coming out of prison with six big duffel bags. Mm. I thought, what's in the duffel bags? You told me those were They're all letters. letters. Letters and cards from every single place. Why don't you tell me about those? Because you're in prison in a box. So my, 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 my concern through all of this, through everything we've done, I've done, is that I will, no, in fact, inevitably I will be killed. I know I will, yeah? That's, not, that's something that in the early years was hard to come to terms with. I'm, I've completely, uh, uh, I'm at ease with that now, yeah? My worry was that it would have been for nothing. My worry was that, bearing in mind the government campaign and the media campaign and all this hate campaign and all the campaign against us to slander me, would that uh, I'd be killed and forgotten about and it won't bring about change. Now, and I, I really thought that deeply after Levi Beals beheaded, just not far from here, when we have a soldier beheaded on our streets, and in fact, nothing doesn't just change, the situation gets a lot worse. Since Lee Rigby was beheaded, 2,000 Muslims were allowed to go fight for ISIS and 600 of them come home. Yeah? Nothing's changed. We're in more in danger than we've ever been. Yeah? Nothing's changed. So when I can see a British armed serviceman beheaded on the streets and the problem excel, and not just excel, but the politicians bend over each other for who can defend Islam the most after it, then um, the, the exact sanctions and reason why the man done it, why the, why, why the man committed the, the terrorists, that Lee Rigby's killer handed a woman a piece of paper with 55 verses from the Quran that he says forced him to do it. Yeah? So when you still, when we're years on, we're still struggling to debate or talk about these issues, and not, there's no mainstream people talking about it, I thought I'll get killed, and it won't have had an effect, or it, it won't have made a difference. And then I watched the response to my arrest and the, the oh, how can I, I'm getting emotional again, it's to, to say that going forward, I now know that, that it would not, it would, I think, cause a revolution. So again, like, if I have this minute, first of all, I'd like to talk to my supporters, but to the, to the government, to the people in positions of power pulling strings, like, I'm sitting in a winning position now because in this battle, because even if I'm killed, which I think you'll let happen or you, you'd want to happen, there's going to be a revolution in this country anyway. And, and, and for me, I want debate, change, I want all these issues brought to the forefront. The whole world has watched and talked about the Muslim paedophile grooming rape of our youth since my arrest. I'm sitting here and I sat in prison. Yeah, I didn't like it, but I smiled many times. And I smiled a lot. And I smiled because everything I do, and, and to be honest, I, I say I'll sacrifice my life tomorrow to bring the change that's needed, yeah? If I'm willing to do that, then all I want is the positive outcome. Yeah, all I want is a safe and prosperous future for the next generation of our children. I, I, I don't think that we should be having to bow our heads and cower every time you hear a bang in London. I don't think four terrorist attacks last year that were successful, 12 stopped. All of these things, the next generation of children being taught that they should be ashamed of who they are, their identity, their culture, their history, their, our own identity, our own culture is under attack. And I, and I want people, us, our, our next generations to feel pride in who they are, pride in where they come from, and they actually to understand who they are and where they come from, and to understand the sacrifices that have been given to them for free speech, free speech which is being curtailed across this country, all of those things. And I sit here now in quite a comfortable position. I don't think I'm in a difficult position. I think they are. I think that because if I'm killed, I'm going to succeed. If I'm not killed... I'm still going to succeed because I may be, I may have had a, a struggle period now, but everything you try to do is not going to work. You will have to kill me. And even by killing me or even by that allowing me to be killed, it's still going to have the, the negative effect that you wish for. And if you can't see now the, 
the the populist revolution that it's swinging i spoke about it Ezra, for 10 years i said nine years ago on stages the swing from left to right that you can't stop that no, there's no there's no islamic organization with funds in the world that can stop it there's no police force that can stop it there's no government that can stop it none of you can stop it it's underway it's happening the elections in austria the elections in italy the elections across the whole of europe it's coming and i know i'm on the right side of history so essentially i, I sit there and, and those people support and sitting and seeing the public support give me that that feeling that i've doubted and that feeling that i need to every time I kiss my kids and walk out of the door to know that it will carry on and it will continue no matter what happens. And I, and I know that. And, and again, my fa and I also know, because in previous prison sentences or previous things that have happened, but this, the world's watched this and the world is quite shocked with what's gone on. It's actually not the worst that's gone on. There's far worse that's gone on. Yeah? And, um, and I know, uh, yeah, and I sit in a position where I'm comfortable and I know that at the minute I may be... I may be having to concentrate on uh, the 27th of September where I'm, I'm sure, I'm sure I'm going to be offered a deal. In this deal, I'm going to be told if I plead guilty, I will get time served. Yeah, That's That means you'll go, you won't have to go back to prison. I won't have jail. to go back to prison. And then, and then, and then the, the, the only difficult position in, in any of this is just because of my family. Because I, my son cried every day for two months. I thought it would take a couple of weeks and it'd ease up a bit. He didn't. He absolutely rocked him. And I then have to make a decision that will put my son at... Upset my family, but... Um, but not... But I don't... I don't want. I don't want to do a deal. I done a deal when I left the English Defence League for, that, for the same reasons because they had me over a barrel ready to go back to prison in solitary confinement. Um, I don't want to be in that position again. I don't want to make a mistake again. Um, so I don't. I, yeah, it's that. It's. I, I know. I know now. I sit here comfortably now, and I know that no matter what happens on the twenty seventh of September, where I, I truthfully believe I'll be back in prison, because unless I curtail, unless I come to an agreement with them that saves their face, I think I'll get slammed. And um. And under whatever technicality they use to say that, the facts are the court case had finished. The facts are I didn't say anything that could have jeopardized, jeopardized that trial. The facts are journalists across our country breach reporting restrictions day in, day out. Every week there's a reporting restriction breach. The facts are no one goes to jail for it. The facts are that um, the British public and the world have viewed this. They've seen what's gone on. I sit here very comfortable knowing that my family will forever be looked after. I've got no worry about that anymore. That was my main worry. I'm, I'm full guns blazing. And I'm blazing in a way that I think I'm going into positions and places where even when I worked for you, Ezra, you, I knew you had my best interests at heart, yeah? I knew you did. You didn't want... Where, where if I said I'm going to do this, Ezra, you'd be saying, no, you're going to get seriously hurt. You're going to end up in prison. Um, I think that to be able to bring about the change that's needed... You, you can't think about the, or worry about those things. You can't, because you'll never get the change done that's needed. So I now know that even coming out of this, coming out of court on the 27th of September, I will go full, full steam ahead. And I don't need to worry anymore, or I don't have the doubt anymore, that A, my family won't be looked after, and B, that people won't care. Because what really, come, what really was a really... It was a bit of... A, was reading the letters I read from two o'clock, two p.m. to seven p.m. every day. That was my. I, I tried to get myself in a regime, and I read, and the letters, and knowing how much it means, and the feeling, the passion, that has look. I become a symbol. It's not all. It wasn't all about because of me or because of what I've done. It become a symbol for people who feel oppressed, who feel silenced, who feel marginalised who feel that they're being, they're being led down a path and our country's being led down a path and they're, they're concerned. And I read so many letters of concern from grandmothers, from mothers, from old people, young people, gay people, straight people, um, Muslim people. I had letters from everyone, everywhere. And what become apparent is the, the size of the feeling. And that, I think that was viewed by the tens of thousands of people marching on Westminster after seven days. Um, I think that they should really, it should be a wake-up call for them, not for me. I, I keep getting told I'm in a difficult pos position, even by my lawyers. I don't think I am. Hmm. I know what I, I know. 
I know what I want to do and I'm going to do, and I want to play a part, whatever part I can, in bringing awareness and attention to issues that are, quite frankly, not just being ignored, but being covered up. Well, we'll be there on September 27th at the Old Bailey as they put you to trial again. The Old again. Bailey. The Old Bailey is a court for the biggest, <laughs> the biggest terrorist or murder trials, the most senior court of our country. Yeah. I'm there for talking into an iPhone outside a courtroom, and, the, and we know it didn't prejudice the trial because the, the trial ended. So we know we, the verdict's been given. The judge actually said that. Um, I'm in there... And whilst we're, just again, I'll just finish on these, these reporting restrictions. I sense, in, I sense these laws being used. I know I'll go off point again now. At one point, I was arrested and I was given a football, an attempt at giving under football law legislation. And what they said is they wanted to ban me from football stadiums. Now, included in this ban was a map that would ban me from the entire Muslim community of Luton. And the Luton Town Centre. So on Saturdays, I would not be allowed into Luton, my hometown. Yeah? The train station town centre, or the entire... They, they drew a map around the entire Muslim community. Now, what they've done in this case was they used football legislation to try and invoke this law, which would limit my freedoms. Yeah? Mm. Now, it was thrown out of court by a judge. It cost me thousands of pounds to defend. The judge's comments were the case against me was dishonest, vague and cagey. It wasn't the police, because Bed's police actually stood up for me in the case when they were put, put in court. It was the football policing unit, which is the Home Office. It was the government. Mm. Yeah? Now, I, these reporting restrictions, I believe, I still believe, are just another law and another way of silencing and stopping people from being knowing the full details day in, day out of what's happening in these cities. And essentially, the minute this case is done on the 27th of September, I'm going to work with others to bring videos and documentaries to every town and city, from every town and city, with the details. And all of the people who are in power, this is why they don't like me, I believe, because the people in power as in the people who took payoffs, didn't lose their pensions, knew these young girls were being raped, stood by and allowed it, police officers, senior police officers, politicians, care workers, I'm going to find them. And the whole British public is going to be made aware who they are and what they ignored and the horrific crimes that have been happening to generation of our children. Well, Tommy, we'll be there to cover you you're a former employee of ours, but we still support you in your mission. I've called you the last lion of the UK, and lions are Famous. untamable, and lions are a symbol of the United Kingdom. I see them everywhere, Trafalgar Square, Buckingham Palace, and we support you. We'll be there on the 27th. We want you to stay safe, but we also want you to fight. So I'm grateful as well. I'm grateful, yeah, I'm grateful to you, Ezra, for stepping in as well. Cause I'm on behalf of our thousands of supporters of you. And, and to every single person, any person. I haven't made another video since, since i come home. This is the first one. So I haven't... I don't want people to... I want people to understand just how much the support meant and the feeling of knowing that I have that support. I'm actually... The week after next, if you're one of the people that wrote to me, um, I'm going to be door stopping. I've, I, I kept my letters. I went through my letters and I put that to that side, that to that side. Story, news, story, um, follow up. So I, I need to go through them all, but I want to. Um, I can't knock at every single person's house. Yeah? Well, that'd be but, exciting. People get but, a home visit from time. But I want to knock yeah. to, to bring flowers and chocolates to some oh, of the people wow. and the women and. Um, I need. I want people to make sure they know how much their support meant. Right. Tommy, thanks for spending time with thanks us. Thanks, well. Cheers. That's my feature interview with Tommy Robinson, the last lion of the United Kingdom. What he told us was heartbreaking, enraging, inspiring, desperate, but a little bit hopeful too. Tommy has to go back to court. The Attorney General is insisting on a retrial for contempt of court for that same incident back in Leeds in May. They actually want to convict him again, maybe to throw him back in prison again. Just yesterday, I received a new invoice from Tommy's law firm, Carson K. They're a good firm who won at the Court of Appeal, but now they have to prepare for his second trial. It will cost tens of thousands of pounds, 
and I'm sorry to ask you again, but if you are at all moved by Tommy's case, please help us by going to SaveTommy.com. Any surplus after the lawyers are paid will go to Tommy's family to help take care of them. Thank you. You saw how grateful Tommy is for your support. That's it for now from us at The Rebel. We'll be there at his next trial in London, and we'll keep telling the truth about Tommy as long as the mainstream media keeps lying about him. Goodbye, and thanks for your support.